Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you to this first uh, VRSI national webinar on advanced retinal imaging. So uh, to borrow a cliche, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, in this COVID era, uh, we are here with uh, this first of its kind VRSI webinar. And uh, this COVID era has in a way spawned a new, brave new world, a worldwide web of webinars, as you might say. So uh, we have an array of experienced and uh, talented speakers who will hold forth on uh, uh, cutting edge developments in uh, various facets of retinal imaging. We're going to cover uh, basic as well as uh, advanced aspects and applications of OCT angiography, the current rage in uh, retinal imaging, new developments in uh, 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 OCT, uh, multicolor imaging, choroidal imaging, ultrawide field retinal imaging. And uh, we have today an August panel with us, and it's my pleasure to introduce them. Uh, Dr. Shobhit Chavla, our president, VRSI, uh, who's director of Prakash Netra Kendra from Lucknow. We have Dr. Muna Bende, deputy director and senior consultant of Bichadetal Services, Shankar Netralia from across the city. From across the border, we have uh, our former president, Dr. Giridhar, uh, um, from Giridhar I Institute, Cochin. And from across the planet, we have uh, one of our own, Dr. Jay Chablani, uh, faculty at University of uh, Pittsburgh. So um, he's the only one to whom we need to say good morning. Uh, Dr. Raja Narayanan uh, from LV Prasad, uh, Secretary of VRSI, will be joining me as moderator in running the session. And with these words, I'd like to uh, invite our president, Dr. Shobhit Chavla, to say a few words and get our session going. Dr. Shobhit Chavla. Thank you very much, uh, Anand, for conceptualizing this uh, session for the first webinar. We are in the middle of a tsunami of webinars in the COVID era, but uh, I'm sure this one is a very meaningful one, as we see by the excellent response it has drawn. Ocular imaging is one of the most important and day-to-day -day OPT activities in any retina center today. And uh, with these words, we look forward to a great webinar with interactive discussions. It encompasses an entity which we have become more familiar with in the last three to four years, that is OCTA, multimodal color imaging, wide field wide field imaging. And with this, I invite Dr. Unni Krishna, uh, Unni Krishna Nair, who is a stalwart in the field, to talk about the basics of, uh, of uh, OCTA. And thank you. Um, thank you. It's an honor to be invited by the society uh, and an honor to kick off the uh, webinars. So I'll just share my screen first. And yeah. So. Okay, I think that's good. Uh, so uh, what I'll be talking about is the basics and some of the artifacts and nuances regarding OCTA. Uh, OCTA as a technology uh, was an evolution of the revolutionary technology that was OCT, but um, mostly it is adding layers and layers of knowledge to our knowledge, but also introducing a lot of chaos to our imaging nowadays. So we'll just go through the basics, which are not very different. There are four tenets of Okta. That is uh, the detection of a speckle, the, uh, the uh, scanning of a volume, understanding what decorrelation is, and viewing using ONFAS. So the first we'll come to is what is a speckle detection. Any uh, speckle is a, a wavefront produced by light. So when, the, uh, when a wavefront or light is reflected off a stationary object, it doesn't vary. But when it is reflected off a moving object, then it produces a change, which is called a speckle. So in principle, this is what happens in an OCT octa. That is, repeated B scans are done on a single point. If there is no change between the two points, the outward result is exactly the same. But if there is a change between the two points, this is what happens. You get a, a difference in the wavefronts. And in the eye, the only 
thing that can change or the only basic moving object is the red blood cells. Therefore, the containment, that is the blood vessels are visualized. So that we come to what is decorrelation. Decorrelation means measuring the change. So this is a small uh, animation that shows at two different points of time. If you have a blood vessel goes through, you can see its path. However, if the passage is too slow, the machine does not detect it. We'll come to this later. And also if it is too fast for the system or the threshold, it may not detect it either. What the OCTA does is that it repeatedly measures or analyzes each particular point. And when there is a movement or when there is a difference that is highlighted and it can, and it is changed to something called a motion contrast image. So the very basis of all OCT angios is this particular concept of the inter-scan time. It's really simple though important. The B scan, it takes a particular amount of time to scan a particular point in the retina. After that, the OCT has to go back to the initial point and scan it again. So the time for scanning plus what we call the flyback time is called the inter-scan time. Essentially, it is, a, it is a time delay between each of these scans happening over here. And why is it so important? The whole sensitivity of the OCT angio to pick up flow is because of the inter-scan time. When there is a very long inter-scan time, that is between the scans, it, uh, the chances of it picking up the motion of an RBC is more. And therefore, it's called increased sensitivity to motion. However, if uh, in longer scans, they can also be affected by eye movement or eye motion. A shorter scan has decreased sensitivity, that's converse, but the untoward effects of bulk eye motion are not there. Newer concepts like VISTA or variable interscan time, where you can vary the interscan time of a machine between fast or uh, longer scans or smaller scans are coming up. To summarize this, the blood cells should have moved on for it to be uh, detected by the, uh, the machine and it should be around uh, dependent on the interscan time. If the blood has hardly moved, that's a very small interscan time, the movement will not be detected. So there are two concepts here. The first concept is sensitivity. As I said, the longer the time, the more sensitive. However, if there is a, a faster movement of uh, RBCs and you have a longer time, many RBCs would have uh, moved across and this particular machine would not be able to detect faster and faster, uh, the difference in faster flows. The next concept in no-city angiography is something called thresholding. Why do you need a threshold? That is, you want to reduce the noise of the system to make sure that noise does not produce an artifactual blood flow. So anything of a low signal is shown as black and anything of a good signal is shown as uh, a flow. The point is that this is purely arbitrary for each system and uh, the value is arbitrary. What it also means is that the absence of an OCTA signal does not imp imply that there is no flow. So why do you need this threshold? You need the threshold to get a good image. All the bad images are removed, so what you get is only the signal. However, if you have too many low signals or black images, that's called an atten attenuation artifact. So because of all these things, you can uh, sometimes you can get the presence of flow where there is no flow, which is a false positive, or where there is flow, you may not pick up due to opacities in the system or attenuation. Another important thing about OCT angio is what we call code registration. When you do an OCT angio, this is the most important thing. You also get an NFAS OCT, you get a cross-sectional OCT, you get a cross-sectional OCTA, and you get an NFAS OCTA. I will come into, we'll talk about the importance of correlating all these things later. How about visualization? It is the NFAS, that is looking at the top of the retina from the top. What is good about it is that it's the simplest form to understand flow by looking at the top. We used to it in angiographies and all those things. The bad part of it is that you're con con converting all this wonderful three-dimensional data into a two-dimensional NFAS image. You're superimposing blood vessel layers and you lose depth information. This is an example. perfusion. Vessels at different layers appear to be merged and some of them seem to have anastomoses because you're looking from the top and you're superimposing. We'll quickly go to the main artifacts. 
uh, this is thing. Whenever you have imaging, there are rules of imaging, and whenever there are rules of imaging, you will get image artifacts. The first one we'll deal with is low signal strength. Signal is the information you get from the uh, eye, and noise is the damage you get from the system. So whenever there's a decrease in media opacity, the signal comes down, but the noise doesn't change. You get an altered signal noise ratio. And whenever the noise is too much, you end up getting something called snow. Uh, many things like even cataract and a dry eye can affect signal acquisition. What, what do you mean by localized loss of signal? When you have a media opacity or something in the media, uh, this is quite interesting. It doesn't affect the incoming light beam. It, it is more affected by the outgoing, the backscattered OCTs affected by all these opacities. They are not collected efficiently by the OCT interferometer. And that is why you get defects like these. These are loss of signal. Another loss of signal you can see in, uh, in this particular area over here, you can see there's loss of signal over here. So the other thing I'd like to talk to you about is movement of the eye, artifacts due to movement of the eye. There are two types of movements. One is because of gross movements of the eye, and the second is within movements within the eye. And artifacts can be due to either movement or the machine correcting the movement can cause artifacts. A white line artifact. What we mean by a white line artifact is that because of a, a sudden saccade, the whole, it looks like a movement. So you get a white line in between. Vessel doubling and stretching is because of the correction of the movement of the eye. That's a software correction and you get these. So in this particular, uh, uh, you see these white line artifacts. This is called a stretch artifact where you see a stretching of the signal over here. This particular one, you can see all the vessels are doubled over here. It's a doubling artifact. And this is called a quilt. You can see a checkered pattern over here. It's called a quilt artifact. So micro, that's what micro saccades produce. But the slow drift of the ice can sometimes totally cause a lack of clarity. And movements are corrected by two things inside the OCTA, that is eye tracking, or the software does a whole motion correction. Fun, uh, an interesting thing is that there are movements within the eye. That is, the choroidal lobules are pulsating. The choroid is not uniform and thick, and all these produce something called Z-axis motion artifacts, but these are usually taken care of by the system itself. Two unpredictable artifacts that actually look like motion artifacts are decorrelation or reflection from large deposits of red, uh, lipid deposits or hard exudates can produce decorrelation and uh, a bright spot or the walls of a cystoid macular edema can also produce artificial vascular markings. One of the most important artifacts is the projection artifact or also called decorrelation tails. What happens when the light passes through, a blood vessel can cause it to reflect back, absorb, refract. And the deeper structures are illuminated by this altered light. And therefore, you get an image on that. So for that, you need a lamp, like a, for any projection system, you need a lamp, which is any retinal vasculature or any chorea capillaris, and you need a screen. That is a highly reflective layers like the plexiform layer and the RP. So this is what, light goes in, some of it is refracted, some is attenuated, and some of this is reflected back. But what happens is that this altered light produces an image on the next available reflective surface of the projection screen. And what, have, what does this mean? You have superficial vessels over here and you see this image persists in a deeper layer. And here on the structure flow correlation, you can see the imprint of the vessels seen in much deeper layers where you know they're not there. There are many ways around it, like subtracting uh, NFAS images or something which is new called projection resolved octa. But essentially, I just want to show you these are certain softwares, the projection artifact software. You can see this. And when you put the PR, PAR off, you can see the blood vessels on the same scan. Again, uh, we're removing the blood vessels and with the artifact removal not on. Most important is, as personally, you have to understand wh whether an image you see is a projection artifact. How can you do that? By doing taking various layers and checking whether the persistent uh, defect is present in superficial layers or deep layers. You can correlate with your flow, structure flow correlation, or you can just plainly look at the structural OCT to see if there is any vascular object correlating with that point. Segmentation artifacts, that is what the machine produces a segmentation, it doesn't, doesn't go in the right layers and you don't get consistent vascular information from that. In myopic eyes, you can see the segmentation is all awry and you get all these strange vascular patterns. Also, if you have, here you see a thick slab which is going through uh, sub-RP space through the RP and through the retina and the SRF, and you cannot make an interpretation properly as to uh, what the NFAS picture shows. 
Also the slab thickness, you can see with the variation of slab thickness, you get huge vascular lesions. When it's thin, you get small vascular lesions and it all depends on where the segmentation lines go. Another patient where you cannot make out abnormal vasculature from normal choroidal vasculature uh, from a scar because the segmentation is all over the place. So what are the, I'd like to go through the final part, the nuances of OCTA recognition. We'll just go through these quickly. This is a very interesting picture. Any lesion, it all depends on where you take the segmentation. The lesion can look bigger, or if the segmentation, it can look smaller even. So this is a, a sequence of pictures where you can see the, uh, the uh, CNBM over there, different sections produce different images, different sizes, and there is a likelihood that you could get totally confused as to the, si the size of the lesion based on where the segmentation goes. This is another picture where you can see the same branching vascular network in three different cuts, three different intensities and sizes, different speeds. As we mentioned earlier, the OCTA can only pick up a particular threshold of uh, velocity of the RBCs. So here, this is one of the typical, uh, the microaneurysm is a typical lesion to show the limitation of octa. You can see a lot of microaneurysms here, but you don't see any lesions in the corresponding OCT angiography over there. Relearning how to look at vascular lesions, as we've got to relearn how to look at leakage. So this is a typical FFA we're all used to. There is no leakage. As you see, there's no leakage on an OCT angio. You just see the vascular elements. Here you would uh, presume a lot of leakage in this area if it was an angiography. Here you just see the collateral formations and a large cystoid macular edema. Acquiring the best image. This is what we like to do. I'll just go through this. Always start with an infrared reflectance image. Know that the eye surface is moist. Know the area of interest and keep the RPE as, as horizontal as possible. So this is an image which was taken and you can see that you can hardly see anything in the, uh, this is a defocused image. You can hardly see anything over here but then you take an IR image, make it crystal clear, the image crystal clear, redo the octa, and suddenly all the layers come clear. Why? Because the defocusing is a main issue in not getting good images. Again, select the best slit, use a thin slab to pinpoint your location and increase the slab width to uh, get more data. So this is a case where you see there's a lesion, you can't make anything out a very thin slab and you can see an, uh, the vascular lesion over there. You slowly increase the slab width over there and you get the entire extent of the lesion for quantification and qualification. So I'm just gonna skip this and then how do you correlate? Every image, as I said, comes with a structural, the cross-sectional and two octas. You have a beautiful lesion over here and then with the cross-sectional structure flow correlation, you see a circular lesion with flow inside it. Another, you can see a widened FAZ. When you look at the OCT along with it, you can see a large cystoid macular edema hanging over there, probably pushing the vascular layers and creating a false a large FAZ. This is a wonderful case of a, a very interesting patient with a near vascularization elsewhere. You can see it on the, this is above the retinal surface. The next one you can see, uh, the, you can still see it over here, but this is the most interesting. This is an RP slab where you can see a projection artifact just because of this particular lesion on the top. So looking for the projection artifact, as I say, there are three things you should go through to just to know that there's a projection artifact. Uh, I, I think I'm going to uh, uh, just, uh, we'll just go quickly go through the different plexuses. We have the superficial vascular plexus, a lot of features about it. It's a regular spider web uh, appearance. Capillaries arise and they drain into the venules. The importance is that uh, they all come like a centripetal pattern to the FAZ. You have your intermittent and deep capillary plexus together. They call the deep vascular complex. It needs projection artifact removal to visualize because the superficial vascular plexus impinges onto it. The intermediate is at the plexiform border and the other, the deep is at the other plexiform border, which are both high metabolic areas. And uh, these are the two areas that produce high reflectivity for uh, projection artifact also. And then this particular uh, plexus, the radial peripapillary plexus, it is a, probably a birth child of the octa, visualized by octa better and not seen on FFA. And this is how the essential plexus is look like. The FIZ is very interesting because uh, the newer and newer concepts say, when you want to uh, measure the FIZ, you have to have a whole retinal thickness because all the three plexuses converge at the FIZ. And the best way to measure it is take the whole retinal thickness. The choreocapillaris is a granular layer. It has ghost vessels also. 
but there's a concept of signal voids which do not correspond to empty chorea capillaries. They are uh, uh, um, an imaging pattern. The satellites and halos will appear dark and you can see them only as you see in this particular patient, you, this particular image, only when there is atrophy of the RP, you can see the vasculature of the RP. This is because the flow is attenuated. So I think I'm done and um, thank you for a patient listening. And I hope uh, some of the things have been clarified regarding the basics and nuances of OCT angiography. Thank you. So thanks, uh, Uni. Uh, Anand, are you there? Yeah. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. 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 So can I, can I ask me. one question? Um, yeah, go ahead, Raja. There are quite a few yes. questions. So, uh, yeah. Only that was a very wonderful presentation. Um, what you have shown is there are lots of nuances uh, to be noted when you are using Octa. And what you see may not be the truth. In fact, uh, you may have to look at a lot of these uh, artifacts and how to remove them. It looks like it reminds me of this uh, Boeing 737 MAX fiasco. That if you don't know how to use the machine, uh, you may be imagining something when actually the opposite may be happening. So what's your take on uh, you know, how to use for a general practitioner that uh, that makes life easier for them because after this presentation, many of them may be wondering: Is it uh, you know too kind, uh, too risky of a machine to be handling and buying at this point of time? Okay, so um, I have got one personal opinion about the whole thing: is that an octa is useful to you if only you have time to sit in front of it. Essentially, if you're the look and go person, uh, you can have a look enjoy a good view of a CNVM and go back to treating it the way you always treated it. But if you really want to use an Octa properly, uh, this is the unfortunate truth. Uh, if you don't know what an artifact is, you would be over treating. If you don't believe your system, you would be under treating. So it's as simple as that. And um, I think we are just on the evolutionary journey to actually uh, really believe Octa uh, I think uh, Jay has a smile on his face because he always tells me uh, as long as there's something called projection artifact, you don't believe anything in Okta. Okay. Uh, so uh, for a general practitioner, I think uh, for not a, a general practitioner, everybody, it's like you see your images, you compare it to whatever knowledge you have existing and you build upon that. That's the only piece of advice I can probably give regarding Okta know about the artifact, know about the nuances, know about what you're scanning. Uh, don't uh, expect it to tell you anything spectacular that you don't already know is something that uh, we keep, keep on have to uh, telling ourselves. Yeah, there are a lot of interesting questions which have come up. Uh, um, one of them is, uh, does systemic BP and its variations affect uh, affecting the speed of RBCs? Can that, has that been shown to affect uh, Octa images? So I can tell you uh, there are, I'm, I'm not sure the answer of that exactly, but there are two aspects to that. One is uh, there is a threshold in which it can pick up. So uh, I don't think an RBC is speeded up uh, like a Ferrari that much when the hypertension goes up, that is one point. And the second point uh, is that uh, hypertension causes a change in the choroidal vasculature, which technically can produce a change, but all the machines have got algorithms to, it's called a Z axis uh, motion artifact. If there's any change in the choroidal vasculature, it seems. So uh, machines take care of that. So uh, there's also a question about uh, manual segmentation. How often do you do it uh, uh, in your practice and uh, for critical cases, would you rely on manual segmentation or uh, would you, you know, uh, uh, always rely on automatic, automated segmentation of machine? Okay, so, uh, yeah. so we did, uh, we were doing a study on macular holes, we did manual segmentation, it takes 30 minutes to do it per patient. So uh, in your practice, I don't think it's a very reasonable idea. Whenever I have a presentation, I sit and do it. So that is the <laughs> gist of the matter. Yeah. Uh, so any last comments uh, by anybody before we go on to the next speaker? Uh, Jay, would you like to add something? Um, nothing much. Just that uh, you don't have to trust what you see on a printout. Take efforts to go and look at the system, and if needed, do the manual segmentation. Just looking at the printout won't suffice. 
Well, a lot of questions coming in. I think we'll move on. I'd now like to invite Dr. Darius Shroff from Shroff Fire Center to speak to us on OCT angiography, specifically for AMD and PC. Darius. Good evening, everybody. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So I'd like to thank uh, VRSI for this opportunity. I'll be, uh, Dr. Unni has laid the groundwork for me and I'll be taking it further by talking on Okta in AMD and PCB. Uh, why do we need Okta at all? It is a good alternative to conventional dye angiography because in FFA, the CNVM is poorly delineated especially when there's fluid, hemorrhage, pigment, RP detachment, or fibrosis. With Okta, the CNVM patterns are distinct and when delineated, and the neovascularization can be seen beautifully even when it is under the RP. In future, it is definitely felt that Okta could help tailored and customized treatment regimens, and this is something we look forward to in the future. So here you see the beautiful patterns, the Medusa head, the C-fan, and the prune tree pattern, which have been detected in Okta. And these have got very beautiful names. And you can see, these are some of our patients. And you can see the Medusa head because of uh, how it looks and the C-fan and, and glomerulus named after kidney glomeruli. And these are terminologies which are in vogue for, for the CNVMs, which are seen on Okta. Uh, when you are confronted with the Okta for CNVM, what should you look at? What is there to see? You have to look at the morphology, the capillary density, the branches, whether loops are present, and the thickness of the vessels. Are the vessels thick or thin? And this, with this background, it's been found to be extremely useful in various subtypes of AMD. In type 1 or occult, where the membrane lies under the RP. In type 2 or classic or subretinal, where the membrane is subretinal. Type 3 or wrapped, which is the intra-retinal uh, type, or in PCB. So these are what we're going to study now one by one in detail. So you can see beautifully the uh, network seen under the RP in the type one CNVM. And here you can see how vast, so one of my the fellows did this for us, and you can see how vast the network is actually. And if you see the B scan of the OCT, it does not look this significant, but you can see how vast the octa is and how nicely the network is being picked up by the OCT in this case. So let's see how it's useful in an actual case and where in a case where it actually helped us. So this was a 64 year old gentleman with distortion of both eyes. And you can see with the red arrows, there was some fluid, but not much of any CNVM seen on the normal B scan. This was in 2015. So we did the routine angiography and we thought it looks query like a CNVM. We are not sure, but of course there was a history of CSR. So we gave anti-VEGF, but you can see the serial OCT. There's no change in the fluid post three anti-VEGF injections. And this led us to a very disappointed patient and a disappointed doctor. We are wondering when we looked at these OCTs, were we missing something? The fluid is just not going away. Is the diagnosis wrong? Or is there something else that we missed? And luckily then Okta came to our rescue. And now you see on the swept of Okta how beautifully you can see these capillary loops and, and these vascular, um, uh, the membrane underneath can actually be seen. And this is when we realized we were on the right track. Of course, that was a time when we measured the choroidal thickness and found extremely thick choroid. And we switched the anti-VEGF. And you can see now how well the patient had responded. And for the first time, we are having a, a dry macula in both the eyes. And this is where Okta really helped us. So also now we move on to type 2 CNVM. Type 2 are the ones which are below the retina. And you can see how beautifully it is seen, the membrane is seen compared to traditional imaging using the octa. And here's another case where you can see the, you can see the membrane beautifully lying spindle shaped just below the retina. And this is a short video. So like Dr. Unni said, you, sh you should always be aware of artifacts. So the way to make sure you're not seeing an artifact, seeing is believing, look at the video yourself. And on the right side of your screen, you can keep looking. The section is going down. And you can see how beautifully the membrane is delineated on the video of the octa. So several authors have studied the characteristics of type one and type two CNV and they find that type one are larger, less demarcated compared to type two, type two are smaller and they of course extend towards the outer retina and higher flow indices are, have been seen with uh, the larger types and also with the type two CNV. 
we move on to rap which is type 3 which and you can see a case of rap and this hemorrhage here this this red color dot is a clue that it's a rap lesion and you can see the hot spot beautifully on the icg angiography and you can see the intradental tissue here on the structural b scan and then how does the octa help us octa or octa is excellent for this because the retinal retinal anastomosis from the dcp is well delineated and a tough shaped high flow network is seen and you can see this beautiful flow in the scan below and you can see this anastomosis above so this is type 3 is also something where we find it very useful to do octa so we move on to pcv now in the previous talk by dr unni you were told we were told about if the uh, flow is too high and too low it's both a disadvantage and you like if you have very very fast flow so this is why people used to say that in polyps because some some people felt it was turbulent some people feel it's slow so you may not be able to see but i think uh, nowadays with some of the uh, newer instrumentation you need to spend a lot of time and that's when you are able to actually see uh, the actual polyps and the bvn well on the octa and uh, of course the edema and hemorrhage kind of uh, makes it difficult to do so but the important thing is to spend time go through each image delineate it and you'll be able to find out so here we can see a polyps and you can see polyps here and you can see the bbn nicely on the octa and of course the one thing you must remember is the icg shows this is the ic which shows the polyps better but the octa shows the bvn much better and this is one of our cases so another case which is a peripaply pcv and this is the the optic nerve is on the side but you can see how beautifully the bvn is seen and you can see the corresponding b scan underneath with the polyp underneath extra foveal polyps with a large bvn so here you can see the multimodal imaging and you can see the lovely polyps on the icg and how beautifully the bvn is captured on the octa and this is the raised b scan underneath showing the flow in the polyps underneath of course this is a corresponding multicolor imaging on the side again you can see in this picture the blue arrow is showing the beautiful bvn and the polyp polyps are delineated by the yellow colored arrow heads on the left phcr which is one of my uh, favorite uh, disease entities and we try to image spend some time on these images and you can see actually this this is the corresponding uh, octa which corresponds to the ffa and to the b scan and you can make out these little polyps here so although it said you can't see but i mean if you spend time i think certain cases you are able to kind of make out polyps on octa so we move how does it help treatment so how does it uh, what happens when you give anti vegf to a, a patient to a cnvm and there are a lot of studies there was a theory by dr richard spade and other fear, uh, authors also and they have shown this uh, the morphology and this depicts the activity of finer vessels and astomosis in branches and once you give anti vegf on the octa you find that there's marked regression of these anastomoses and the capillaries and they all drop out but there is always recanalization and you must remember the thicker vessels are not affected by anti vegf because they are surrounded by pericytes so this is what you have to keep in mind that you these are not going to go away so that doesn't mean we stop treatment we have to keep, keep on continuing the therapy but you have to be aware of the morphology of the cnvm on octa and continue our therapy so these are some cases this is just regression this is you can see the membrane is still there but how much less it is now looking and this has just been taken 6 days after an anti vegf injection this is another patient of ours who maintained good response after the three loading doses and was stable for 5 years and the medusa head is seen beautifully on the octa on the right side this is an interesting case which had both a type 1 and a type 2 cnvm and you can see the regression of the the type 2 the one above but the one below the type 1 part still persists underneath so this is something we need to remember and not get disheartened by when we see this this is another this is one of those patients with the peripheral polyps and you can see how beautifully it's depicted and this is matched beautifully by the oct b scan where the fluid has gone down post anti vegf therapy so now comes the question is can there be a, a neovascular membrane in non exudative md amd and this is the work phenomenal work of uh, dr rosenfeld and colleagues who studied eyes with asymptomatic intermediate non exudative md 
and they found that on ICG, a plaque was seen in three eyes with no evidence of anything on the FAP OCT. And the swept source OCTA showed the blood flow in cases which they thought were actually drusen. So you can see beautifully, this is what they thought were drusen. And when they did the swept source, they actually found this, so the membrane underneath and a beautiful membrane, in fact. So when we see such studies, some questions arise that should these lesions be treated at all? Are we, uh, should we treat such lesions? Could they, because they could be, of course, precursors of a more aggravating form and, of course, warrant a, a closer follow up. And other thing is that could they be providing nutritional support for the underlying RP and photoreceptors? And are they, in fact, preventing macular atrophy? So, this is another take on this thing. So, I think there's no answer to this yet. We have to study it more. And I would like to conclude that you see beautiful patterns on Okta in CNVM. You can find these non exudative subclinical CNVMs, the significance of which is not fully known at this time. But of course, they warrant closer follow up. And future treatment algorithms could be based on morphological response to therapy. So the current practicality and utility of these patterns is open for our panel for discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daraj. Uh, that was a very wonderful presentation. In fact, uh, there are lots of questions for you, very probing questions uh, like uh, Unni's presentation. Um, so one question, in fact, from Dr. Giridhar is, what is the role of uh, OCT angiography in follow-up? How do you use it? Or is it uh, more useful to have OCT rather than OCTA in follow-up? So what are your views on that? So I think that's an excellent question. Because, uh, uh, so I would like to just say, so first time we see a patient, we would do a multimodal imaging, including OCTA. But for follow-up, Definitely, Okta kind of guides us, but I would like to make it, I think, clear that at this point of time, we do not treat a patient or repeat injection only based on Okta. We would be looking at fluid, cystic spaces, other biomarkers on the B scan, and the treatment guidance is actually, frankly, not based on Okta. It is more based on what we find clinically, whether the patient is symptomatic or not, and on the presence of fluid or cystic spaces on the B scan. I would like to ask uh, also what, what Dr. Raja feels about this. No, I, I agree with you in general. Uh, there's also a question from Dr. Shobit uh, about the role of ICG versus uh, Okta in diagnosing polyp. And in fact, I would like to add a rejoinder to this. There's also a question from Dr. Hemant Murthy. Would on -fast imaging be better than Okta in detecting polyp? So you have both ICG, on -fast, Okta. So what would be your choice? I think the best choice for detecting polyps still would be ICG, but uh, we are definitely picking up. And now the problem is something invasive. We don't want to do it too frequently. So in such cases, I find Okta is nice to follow up patients, but yet I agree that definitely for the for diagnosing a patient, I would definitely have a multimodal imaging and for polyps per se, ICG is definitely better. So Anand, how do you think we are on time? I think we are running a bit late. We are shooting a little behind. I think Vinod, if you have a last question, you had an interesting question. Uh, hi, Dryas. Excellent presentation. Uh, you mentioned the role of uh, OCT in detection of BVN. So my question is, if we do not know that definitely this is a case of BVN on ICGA, can we say that it is BVN on OCTA? Or we do just we say that it is a case of any CNVM on OCTA? That's a good question. I think uh, the role of multimodal imaging is important. I think just on OCTA, you're right. We cannot diagnose it. If we just see that pattern, we would just say it's a CNVM. But once we have multimodal imaging, once we know that this network is connecting to polyps, then we would say it's BVN with more confidence. It's, it's an aneurysmal CNVM. So whatever you see, if you have aneurysmal dilations at the end, which you yes. may diagnose in whatever modality, there is still a network with which there is an aneurysmal dilution. I think Anand, you can take a call whether to take more questions or go on. Yeah, I think I think we can move on. Uh, now, I'd like to invite Dr. Muna Bende to uh, give us an excellent talk that we always expect her, of her on Okta in diabetic retinopathy and vascular occlusion. Dr. Muna. Can you see my screen and hear me? Yes, we can. So good evening, and uh, I must thank Anand for making me read on Okta and diabetic retinopathy and retinal brain occlusions. I thank my colleagues for having shared some of their uh, data.
so the clinical pathological changes that you would see, which are fairly common to both retinal vein occlusion and diabetic retinopathy, are retinal vascular tortuosity, which in the course of time may persist, normalize, or sclerose, microaneurysms, hemorrhages, edema, and heart exudates, periphobial capillary engorgement, intraretinal microaneurysms, which are typical for diabetic retinopathy, collaterals, neovascularization, and of course, epiretinal membranes and retinal detachments. Now, where do you look for abnormalities in the opta for retinal vascular disorders? Basically, the retinal vasculature is confined to the nerve fiber layer, the ganglion cell layer, the inner plexiform layer, inner nuclear layer, and outer plexiform layer. So this is where you should be looking for abnormalities in retinal vascular disorders. All other layers are avascular. So we have the superficial vascular plexus that is confined to the nerve fiber layer, the inner plexiform layer. Then you have the intermediate capillary plexus which straddles the inner nuclear layer. And you have the deep capillary plexus which comes up to the outer plexiform layer. So these are the various slabs that one would look for. The intermediate capillary plexus is attained by manual segmentation and is available on certain machines like the Heidelberg. So what are the changes that you would see in vascular disorders? They could be qualitative or quantitative. As I mentioned earlier, they are localized to the superficial and deep vascular plexus. And these include non-perfusion areas, vascular tortuosity, collateral formation, abnormalities of the peripheral capillary plexus as well as the peripheral capillary plexus, dilatation of the veins, microaneurysms, cystoid changes, non-perfused ghost vessels, and neovascularization. The quantitative changes are density of the vessels in the foveal and peripheral area, measurement of non-perfusion areas, and measurement of the PAS. All these are purely investigational at the current moment in time. Now, how would OCTA compare versus OCT versus FFA versus the clinical picture in these vascular disorders, typically for retinal vein occlusion? There is a good correlation with the clinical, anatomical, and fluorescein angiographic findings of capillary dropout, retinal atrophy, increased vessel caliber, shunt vessels, the presence of intraretinal edema, and neovascularization. Structures which are better visualized by OCT are irregularities of the PAS that are not obscured by leakage and changes in the microvasculature that are located in the deep capillary plexus. Our ability to image the deep capillary plexus is one of the big advantages of OCTA versus fluorescein angiogram in these disorders. However, OCT is much better to quantify macular edema and assess response to treatment unless you use a reconstructed C-scan. And of course, fluorescein angiogram is better to detect leakage, but you can work around this as I will show you as we go. This is a patient with a branch retinal vein occlusion. You see the hemorrhages, you see the cotton wool spots. The fluorescein angiogram shows leakage and you see the structural OCT shows macular edema. But what does the OCT angiogram show you? This is the superficial capillary plexus of a patient with an infrotemporal branch veil occlusion, shows large areas of non-perfusion, indicative of ischemia. This is the structural scan which shows that there are some cystoid spaces which are paraphobial in nature, and this is corroborated on the structural OCT. So most of the time we need to compare the OCT angiogram along with the structural OCT. In this patient with a central retinal vein occlusion, you see that the perfusion is good, but the vessels are dilated and tortuous. The on pass image, the structural image, shows you that there is cystoid macular edema that is corroborated on the structural OCT. So this is just an idea of how we would compare the different investigations. Now, where do you look? Like I mentioned, we look at the superficial and the deep capillary plexus. And changes in retinal vein occlusions are more obvious in the deep capillary plexus than the superficial capillary plexus. In this
this patient, you see there are areas of ischemia in the superficial capillary plexus, but seem to be much more in the deep capillary plexus, which is very typical of these conditions. And very often we are stuck for the size of the image. Most machines have a three by three millimeter or a six by six millimeter, sometimes going to an eight by eight millimeter scan. But certain newer machines like the Plexily do have a large image. This is a montage image on the Plexily, the swept society, showing the entire extent of non-perfusion in this patient. This is a 12 by 12 millimeter scan. Again, you see the changes are much more dramatic on the deep plexus. Now, machines like the Heidelberg are able to image the intermediate plexus. And sometimes you may see that the changes are more visible in the intermediate plexus than the superficial or the deep plexus. You see this picture. This is the superficial plexus. This is the deep plexus. This is the slab going through the intermediate plexus. And this is the avascular slab. So you see that the changes in the intermediate plexus are little more than changes in the deep plexus. How can you follow up with your OCTA? This is a patient with good visual acuity and ischemic retinal vein occlusion. This is the superficial plexus showing the ischemia. You see that he doesn't have any macular edema. His vision was 6-9. Two months later, the vision is 6-9. Everything looks the same. But if you look carefully, you see that vascular changes have become more pronounced. These are very subtle changes that can, some, that can be picked up on an opta, which may not be evident to you otherwise. And then this is another wide field image. This is a wide field photograph of a patient with a infronasal branch vein occlusion. And you see the opta nicely picking up the neovascularization with non-perfusion anterior to it. As I mentioned, sometimes the changes in the superficial plexus may be only limited to vascular dilation and tortuosity, and you may not see the cystoid macular edema on the, uh, the uh, post-opta. You compare it with the structural B scan, and on the right, you see the unfast reconstructed image showing very well the cystoid macular edema. You can sometimes use this retina depth encoded image, which combines the superficial, the deep, and the avascular retina slabs with color code, showing that, yes, there is a green area of opacity, which is seen here in the center, indicating that there is fluid or edema in the deep retinal plexus. Again, this is a patient with a non-ischemic central retinal vein occlusion, Changes are very subtle except for dilation and tortuosity of the vessels. You look at the deep vascular slab. If you look at the superficial vascular slab, you don't see much. But in the deep vascular slab, you see that there is some amount of edema. One more important finding that we found in patients with retinal vein occlusion and unexplained visual loss that cannot be attributed either to atrophy or edema is the presence of ischemia in the deep capillary plexus or the paracentral acute middle maculopathy. So if you do an opta in these patients, you see the superficial plexus looks all right, but if you, you see a dark area in the deep capillary plexus with some amount of ferning, this is very typical of paracentral acute middle maculopathy which you need to suspect in an eye with retinal vein occlusion when you cannot explain the vision. Coming to diabetic retinopathy, these are the typical lesions, and I'll show you some interesting references that I found in the course of preparing for the talk today. Why do we not only mention that you cannot see microaneurysms in patients with diabetic retinopathy? Why don't you see them? This picture very elegantly describes why you cannot see them. These are the opta images. This is the fluorescein angiogram image. Because microaneurysms can be at different levels in the retina. Here you see there are microaneurysms which are visible in the, super, in the deep plexus. Here you see microaneurysms which are visible even deeper. Some of them leak, some of them do not. And why do they not leak? They do not leak because the flow is too low to detect. Sometimes you can overlay the OCT image with your B scan.
and you see that areas which are red indicating retinal thickening show microaneurysms that leak. So this is a way you can identify leaking microaneurysms by overlaying the OCT image. And this also showed various patterns of microaneurysms on the octa and found that saccular or fusiform aneurysms were more likely to leak. Again, this is a nice overlay of an octa along with the superficial ND plexus and the OCT showing that this is actually the entire structure of the microaneurysm, this green one. In the center is a yellow spot. And this green is the area of fibrosis or hyalinization. And when you have microaneurysms that are hyalinized, they are not picked up well on octa because of the very slow flowing. And this is a patient who had a localized edema, a diabetic macular edema. And you see in the deep plexus, you see the single microaneurysm, which is responsible for the edema. So this is where you can ideally target the microaneurysm even for focal treatment. Another patient where you have changes in the superficial plexus, which are not very evident, changes in the deep plexus are more evident, and changes in the intermediate plexus are even more evident and you see the cross-sectional scan in the intermediate plexus, it shows that the maximum amount of edema is in the intermediate capillary plexus. Another interesting article I came across was, how would you classify neovascularization in diabetic retinopathy based on octa? And they found that there was a very elegant article, and I think many people can go through this one. It shows that there were three types of neovascularization based on octa. You can have a focal stalk that comes up through the retina and grows on the surface. We all would love to operate these cases. Then you have a single stalk which branches within the retina and then goes out in different directions as you see here. Then you have type three neovascularization, which most of us would dread if we had to under, patient had to undergo surgery, where you see multiple stalks coming within the retinal surface, growing on the ILM, and then subsequently into the vitreous cavity, and this is what it looks like. And now what is IRMA, and can it be confused with neovascularization? We know that IRMA occurs within the retinal surface. This is a slide where you suspect an IRMA and you also wonder, is there a neovascularization? And if you follow these areas slowly, you will find that this part of the complex is intraretinal. Suddenly it breaks through the ILM and then you have another structure on the top, which is actually the neovascularization. So you see this is IRMA converting into neovascularization. Those are a few interesting things that I found when looking at OCT features in diabetic retinopathy. Now, in pro sometimes your patient may be very high risk for fluorescein angiogram, systemically non-stable, and that's when OCT angiogram has a huge advantage. And these are pictures taken, the wide field images of a patient with poor systemic control, macular edema, subretinal fluid and large areas of neovascularization in both eyes with capillary non-perfusion anteriorly. And how do you confirm it that it's neovascularization and not IRMA? We don't always have histological features, but you can do the VR interface lab where you image above the surface of the retina and you see that the neovascularization of the disc is very well seen in the vitro-retinal interface lab. What happens when you follow up a patient? This is a gentleman who had panretinal photocoagulation as well as anti-VEGF injections for high-risk PDR and CSME. And you see his neovascularization on the disc here. You have neovascularization here. And he just came for a review after three weeks. So out of academic interest, I repeat with the OCT angiogram. And you see how the neovascularization has shrunk and also the neovascularization elsewhere. So the octa can very nicely show you the regression of neovascularization. Well, clinically, it may not be very evident. 
This is even better seen on the vitreoretinal interface lab. You see the neovascularization of the disc very well pre-treatment, post-treatment, this has shrunk. This is another use of the doctor. Again, a patient with multiple systemic issues in diabetic macular edema. This is 2014 when she started treatment for diabetic macular edema. Four years down the line suddenly presented with a large subretinal hemorrhage. And we did an octa and found that she had a polypoidal CNB in the sub RT space. And this was her after uh, one month of injection. Now, what are the limitations and artifacts? Small scanning areas, unless you have wide field images, which are possible. Sometimes you can put in your 20D lens and get a wider field. Segmentation errors, which related to variations in macular anatomy, like fractional detachments and large macular edema. Inability to determine the presence of leakage, but then you're also able to see through the leakage and see if there's a vessel beneath it. The microaneurysms may not always be apparent on octa because they may have flow rates below the detection threshold and they may be at a different level. Capillary non-profusion areas do not change with treatment. And this is seen even on fluorescein angiogram. So that is difficult to assess. And inability to visualize laser scars. So you cannot really tell whether your laser has been adequate or not unless you compare it with a uh, clinical photograph. Image artifacts, yes, caused by patient motion, shadowing from retinal pathology, such as CME and vitreous hemorrhage, and limited ability to may visualize blood movement out of the detectable flow limit. This is an interesting paper where they used ultra wide field protocol to enhance the automated classification of uh, severity of diabetic retinopathy. Looks very much like our ROP classification, 10 degrees, 10 to 30, 30 to 50, and 50 to 100, color-coded accordingly. And they found that, oops, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm missing a slide here. But with more severe the retinopathy, the purple areas in the periphery definitely extended further. And again, the earliest evidence of preclinical diabetic retinopathy was revealed using OCT perfused capillary density, and it was found that patients with preclinical diabetic retinopathy also had a slightly larger area of non-perfusion compared to normal patients. Photoreceptor damage in diabetic choroidopathy has also been noted, and you see areas of dark spots in the choreocapillaries. I'm sure Jay will talk about it in his talk. And finally, can you predict progression of diabetic retinopathy and development of diabetic macular edema? Yes, the FAS area, the vascular density, and the fractal dimension of the deep capillary plexus do predict diabetic retinopathy progression. But the vascular density of the superficial plexus could predict diabetic macular edema development. And of course, AI cannot be an automatic diagnosis, cannot be far behind. And they have shown that automatic diagnosis using clinical biomarkers, optical coherence tomography, and OCT angiography is reliable. These are our studies in Shankar Netralaya. We have three which are in progress. Correlation between OCTA and multifocal ERG in diabetes with or without retinopathy. Association between contrast sensitivity and neuronal changes. We have one where we compared the foveal levascular zone in diabetic retinopathy, myopia, and normal fundus. Finally, one which did tell us that retinal perfusion indices can vary depending on the size of the cube that you use. This is my last slide. OCT and vascular disorders, where are we now? We're able to visualize the vascular, morphological, and distributional characteristics in different layers, more specifically the deep vascular plexus, which helps us understand the pathological processes, determine the activity, predictive value, and enable appropriate treatment and follow-up. We have newer mortalities of classification of microaneurysms, neovascularization, and PDR. And while the vessel density and foveal avascular zone are the most investigated qualified indices, they are usually still in the experimental stage and clinical application is still not 
ready. So thank you for your patient listening. Um, so Anand, I, I, I think that we are uh, way over time, but I still think that it's such a popular session today that almost a thousand people are attending this meeting. Absolutely, yeah. I think yes. uh, we can go with uh, questions. There are lots of questions for everyone. There's no rush, I guess. So you can still continue with the questions. Correct. So what we'll do is uh, we'll just take a, a couple of questions here right now before we move on to Anirudh. And uh, one, of, one of the questions that has come in is about, uh, uh, do, you, do you rely on, uh, in your practice now, on FFA, for example, for specifically looking at uh, macular ischemia, has, uh, has Okta completely taken over that aspect? And uh, with FAZ also another allied question is, which plane specifically when you, when you manually segment to look for that? So has Okta taken over my practice? No, for looking for macular ischemia, more specifically. Looking for ac macular ischemia, yes. Okta is good enough because uh, you have the structural OCT scan as well. You're able to see the deep plexus, superficial plexus, compare it with the uh, thinning on the B scan. So I think for macular ischemia, Okta is good enough. Okay. Was to treat with laser for microaneurysms, I think still I would do a fluorescein So, uh, any other questions from the panel for Dr. Muna or any other observations? Okay, if not, then uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, uh, yes, Dr. Giridhar, you have a question? Uh, we are not hearing you. You can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, sir. I have only one question. In a, in a medical retina practice, I mean, in a busy medical retina practice, uh, when we do octa, and di I mean, do you have any uh, specific indications for doing octa and diabetic retinopathy? Because it's quite, very difficult. I don't know how many of you do routinely octa in patients with diabetic retinopathy uh, in, your, in your practice. So, I mean, is there, are there, I mean, do you have any take home messages to the audience as to what sort of clinical situations in diabetic retinopathy probably you would like to do an opta? Yes, sir. Supposing I see a very severe non proliferative diabetic retinopathy, I have a patient whose general condition is a little unstable and I'm hesitant to do a vaccine angiogram, I would definitely do an opta. The thing is that most of your pictures are with a plex light. Now, uh, the thing is, I mean, that is, I mean, uh, all of us are broke now. So, <laughs> no, sir, not, uh, <laughs> now, uh, I mean, I don't think the images that we get in with our normal octa. No, no, are... not all are with plexalites. Some are the regular <laughs> ones. <laughs> uh, no, uh, so, you can use a 6 by 6 or an 8 by 8 millimeter eight. scan. That is fairly good enough to yeah. study the macula. Yeah, yeah, good points, Dr. Giridhar. I think we are uh, uh, having another session of how not to go broke next week. We'll have, uh, yeah. So, Anand, uh, uh, do you think we can go on to the next talk? I think, I, I think we can go on uh, to Anirudh. Uh, it's our pleasure to introduce Anirudh Agarwal, uh, he's the recipient of the Professor Nam Parimal Sami Young Research Award, budding and upcoming retina specialist. He'll be talking to us on octa and inflammatory vascular pathology. Very good evening. Uh, thank you uh, to the society for this uh, privilege and honor to present on ocular imaging in uveitis. Um, just like to confirm if my slides are visible. Just hold on. It's uh, still waiting to be uploaded. Yeah, you're okay. good to go on. Thank you, sir. So in the past uh, one hour, we have seen a number of very nice images of the diseases, medical diseases of the retina, and how different uh, is the uveitis from these conditions, and what information does OCT angio give us in these conditions? Now, because of, I think, the lack of time, I'll focus on very specific entities that we commonly encounter in our clinics, and often we find challenging, 
And I will go over some cases of the white dot syndromes, which include punctate enocoroidopathy, mutes, MPE, and the commonly seen ones that include multifocal choroiditis and serpiginous choroiditis. I will not be focusing on POHS and birdshot since it is not a very commonly encountered disease, especially in the Indian subcontinent. So let's directly go on to our first case. And I have a series of five cases here. And what we'll do is from each case, we'll try to get a learning lesson of how OCTA adds to our knowledge and helps us manage these patients. Now, this is a 24-year-old Asian Indian girl, and her complaint is very specific. She complains of multiple scotomas in the field of vision. She's a myopic girl, about minus five diopters. And what you can essentially see on the fundus is presence of these multiple yellowish lesions, which are involving the macula of both the eyes. And it's definitely much more prominent in the left eye. If you do an OCT scan, which is passing, let's focus first on the right eye. And here we're able to see that there is presence of a dome-shaped elevation, which is involving the outer retinal layers. And what you notice here is that there is a breach of the Brooks membrane. The Brooks membrane is not seen in the region where you would normally expect it to be there. If you compare the left eye, and these are scanned, this is a scan which is passing through the lesion. And what you're essentially seeing is an intact Brooks layer, which is there right under the lesion. Although the lesion appears morphologically the same, it's a dome-shaped elevation there. The, what is the significance of this? Probably the OCT won't be able to tell us, but let's go on further. So the diagnosis here is definitely punctate in a choroidopathy. It's a RP there is an RP elevation with sub RP hyperreflective signals. And we're able to see the outer retinal disruption, which is very characteristic of tick and a punched out lesion that you are appreciating over here. Now this patient came to us in November, 2017. And at that point, you can see that the vision was not a very significant complaint. She was actually seeing quite well, six, six, nine, six, six. And the only complaint was scotoma. And in the right eye, you can see that this patient over the course of more than six months until June, 2018, does not have much change on the OCT. The OCT appearance is practically the same. However, if you look at the OCT angio, which was done in November 2017, you find that there is a very small sort of a network like uh, picture here on the outer retinal slab. Now, this was the same that we observed in June 2018. And of course, like most of us would do, we don't have any fluid. We don't have really a guideline here and we have not injected anti-VEGF in this patient. Now, moving further, you can see that from June 2018, just a couple of months later in August, this patient comes with a hemorrhage. And you can see that this is a very important uh, clinical sign here where you have a hemorrhage which is associated with the lesion and you have a drop in the visual acuity. And of course, the first thing that you would like to rule out is presence of the underlying membrane. And as you see the serial OCT, although nothing much has changed between November 2017 to June 2018, you have fluid now in August and you have a significant drop in the vision. And if you look at the OCT angio, you find a very you know, significant increase in the neovascular network. Now this basically means that in conditions which are inflammatory, the behavior of neovascular membranes is not like your AMD eyes. These tend to progress really fast and they can cause significant visual damage by the time there is fluid in the retina. So the learning lesson number one is that I like to use OCTA in PIC to detect these inflammatory neovascular membranes. So if you talk about punctate in a choroidopathy, I do not use it to study the inflammatory lesion itself, but to reiterate, I use it to detect the inflammatory choroidal neovascularization. And a lot of these patients would harbor an underlying CNV. Moving on to my second case, this is a very typical presentation that we see in our country and in the Indian subcontinent. This is a young male who has bilateral diminution of vision. And I'm showing you the left eye first. 
and you can see a very characteristic serpiginous like choroiditis which is involving the posterior pole and the autofluorescence is showing you active lesions which are hyperfluorescent and so there is this triple kind of hyperfluorescence so most of these lesions appear active on the autofluorescence imaging this is the right eye and you can see that the active lesions in the right eye are actually involving the foveal center which is a matter of concern this is the combined fluorescein icg of this patient and you can see here especially on the icg i'd like you to focus you have these hypofluorescent lesions which are in the center and these lesions are going to be hypo in the early phase and they continue to remain hyper in the late phase as you can see this blown up image here of the icg uh, you can see that the lesion appears to be hypo in the center and now this on your right is the oct angio picture and the on the oct angiography you can clearly see this area of hypo reflectivity involving the corio capillary slab and you can actually delineate the involvement of the corio capillaries much better on the oct angio compared to the icg this is one very important advantage of the oct angio and as you can see here that this is a patient of serpiginous like choroiditis wherein we know now that the primary pathology is involving the corio capillaries and there is presence of inner ischemia of the choroid and you have defects on the octa flow deficits which exactly correspond to the icga now if you look at this combined uh, fluorescein and icg during the healing process once the lesions have healed at 3 months on the icg you can actually see now that the lesions have nearly resolved you do not have much of the hypofluorescence that you had at baseline and so there is near complete resolution of the corio capillaries inflammation what does the oct angio tell you and the oct angio very beautifully shows you the healing pattern of the corio capillaries you do have some disturbance of the corio capillaries and that can be made out very clearly in the follow up image so the learning lesson number 2 for us is that healing of lesions is accompanied by reduction in corio capillaries flow deficit area in serpiginous like choroiditis as well as serpiginous choroiditis of the autoimmune variety now we have also seen in this paper is under review right now in retina that lesions which are less than 0.1 mm square tend to resolve with minimum flow voids what do i mean by that as you can see here this patient has progressively shown you very good healing pattern on the oct angio but that's not always the case especially if you have large lesions for example this patient here as you can see there is a pla large placoid lesion and on the combined fluorescein icg the image right on top of your screen you are able to see an active lesion here on the icg the activity is determined by the presence of the hypofluorescence at the active edge and you can see that the oct angio exactly is going to show you that on the corio capillary slab so definitely what you are seeing you are able to really co localize very well on your oct angio now coming to the patient at 3 months and you can see on the icg the lesion has really healed well you do not have the hypo edge on the icg and what you have is the disturbance of the corio capillaries there is a lot of corio capillaries atrophy and you are able to see medium to large size choroidal vasculature if you do the oct angio again you are able to see the same thing a mishmash of medium to large underlying choroidal vessels and you have a corio capillaries atrophy and this is different from your baseline image because here you do not have the area of flow deficit so your lesions have healed but they have healed with a lot of corio capillaries atrophy so moving on i'm just going to erase all the ink and this is our next case here of a young male with no previous history and the only complaint is spots in front of both the eyes Here you can see on the ICG a large placoid lesion, and on the OCT you have disturbance of the photoreceptor layer. The placoid lesion is hypo to hypo on ICG, and the diagnosis I think is very clear. It's an MPE lesion. Similar to the serpiginous choroiditis, MPE lesions appear hyporeflective on the OCT angio. They have more confluent patterns, and again we are able to confirm that this is a primary choriocapillaritis. 
So the learning lesson number three is OCT angio shows you flow deficits in MPE predominantly involving the choreo capillaries. Again, this is another patient, 51 year old uh, Caucasian woman. Uh, this is the patient that I had seen during my fellowship in the US. This patient has complaints of blurriness and spots in front of the eye. And you can see these hypo spots which are present in the left eye. This is a patient of mutes where the lesions are hypo to hypo, but they could be iso to hypo on ICG. The OCT appearance is actually very characteristic. You have the sort of, uh, you know, uh, like a blast kind of a thing happening at the photoreceptor layer, which is involving the ellipsoid and the interdigitation zone, but sparing the RPE and the underlying choreocapillaries. So the very important aspect of mutes is that you have an intact choreocapillaries layer. So even if you do an OCT angio in the choreocapillary slab, you will find nothing. There is no choreocapillaries ischemia in mutes. That is why there is a recent controversy where they're terming the mutes to be a primary photoreceptoritis. There is no alteration in the choreocapillaries on OCTA. And this is another patient where, or with mutes, and I'm just showing this image to show you the importance of the blue peak autofluorescence and near infrared autofluorescence, which show you two diametrically opposite patterns in mutes. One is hyper and one is hypo. And this is one very useful uh, investigation in uh, patients with mutes. But remember, you will still find nothing on the OCTA. So the learning lesson number four is OCTA in mutes shows intact choreocapillaries. Finally, I would like to summarize by saying that in PIC, you do OCTA to look at inflammatory CNV. In multifocal choroiditis, serpiginous choroiditis, and serpiginous like choroiditis, you would like to do OCTA to determine true choreocapillaries ischemia and to see follow up of these patients. In MPE, you would find choreocapillaries deficit of confluent pattern. And in MUDES, you will do OCTA, but you will find no choreocapillaries loss. And finally, to summarize, there have been number of studies using OCTA to, in retinal vasculitis. There is no such consensus right now to determine whether OCTA really is very useful in retinal vasculitis. Yes, it is useful in occlusive vasculitis to, de to determine presence of macular ischemia and capillary non-perfusion, but this is one area of research which needs you know, further uh, focus and we need to wait uh, to find out if there are more studies coming up that help us in this field. With this, I would like to thank you uh, and uh, just hand over to the panel. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you, Anirudh, for an excellent talk. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll go straight up ahead to uh, Dr. Pukraj. Dr. Pukraj Rishi is a senior consultant at Shankar Netrali and has done a lot of uh, great work on imaging. So I'd request uh, Dr. Pukraj to uh, straight away uh, start his presentation on novel OCT uh, biomarkers in terms. Uh, thank you, Anand. Um, I hope I'm audible and I'll be speaking on uh, OCT, Noble Terminologies and Biomarkers. Right. So, um, biomarker is essentially a characteristic of... Uh, uh, can you, Pukraj, uh, make it uh, PowerPoint slide presentation mode? Okay. So... Is that okay? Yes, that's good. Okay. So... Uh, I'll be speaking on novel terminologies and uh, biomarkers in OCT. So some of the um, terms uh, are often used and uh, uh, they are um, uh, uh, because of, uh, so basically I'll be using the, some very basic terminologies 
and touching on some newer ones. So the biomarkers which are OCT based can either be quantitative or qualitative. The qualitative ones could include those which have a retinal structural alterations like gross alterations, including central subfield thickness or the cube average thickness. And others could be ultrastructural, meaning disruption of uh, external limiting membrane or uh, lipsoid zone. There could be others which are surrogate endpoints, uh, meaning findings in the choroid and certain others at the vitro-retinal interface. So uh, it could be a qualitative assessment, which could uh, help us prognosticate uh, uh, different uh, conditions. And uh, this slide shows a staggered view of uh, those biomarkers at different levels, anatomical levels, uh, namely at the VR interface within the neurosensory retina and at the outer retina, at the RPE basement membrane choriocapillaris level, at the choroidal level, at the choriosclerol junction, and then the applications of artificial intelligence and the biomarkers in systemic disease. So the simple ones, uh, we are fairly familiar with the flying saucer sign. Something similar to that is the perifovular inner retinal thinning with the uh, hydroxychloroquine. And uh, this is a marker of an uh, impending maculopathy. So drill is a uh, very simple basic. We are familiar with this. It's a disorganized retinal inner layer, and it is to be looked at within the uh, central 1500 microns region of the fovea. And it denotes ischemic changes. It's a very good marker for diabetic macular edema. Here at the arrow, you can make out, uh, particularly, uh, which is not very far from the fovea, the inner retinal layers are not very well delineated. Okay, so then comes um, SANFL. So these terminology might uh, sound like alphabet soup, but they are pretty easy to understand. This is uh, denotes swelling of the arcuate retinal nerve fiber layer. And this happens in patients undergoing macular hole surgery and island peeling. The scan on the top shows you the swelling in the nerve fiber layer, the scan below, the structural OCT scan shows you resolution of the swelling in the awkward nerve fiber layer. So this can uh, give us a feedback on how our tissue handling has been in cases of island peeling. Another associated finding is that of dissociated optic nerve fiber layer. So this sign appears as a dimple and it is seen as multiple awkward striae on the inner retinal surface within the area of the peeled island. Here you can see uh, on the left, this image which shows uh, um, a demarcated area of island peeling and the dimpling on the uh, vitreoretinal surface, vitreoretinal interface uh, showing adequacy of island peeling. So this brush border pattern is uh, very familiar to us uh, handling cases of CSR, but it also is seen in patients who have uh, tumors like choroidal nevus or circumscribed choroidal hemangioma which can masquerade as central serous retinopathy. This dipping sign, again familiar with the CSR cases, here the outer retina uh, tries to impinge on the RPE because of the fibrin. The pearl necklace sign is a contiguous ring of small hyperreflective dots within the inner lining wall of the cystoid spaces. This denotes chronicity and a poor prognostic outcome. So the Optical density ratio, which is associated with intraretinal cystoid spaces, can be analyzed by having a ratio of the optical density of the fluid within the cystoid spaces and comparing it to the optical density of the vitreous body. So this optical density uh, derives its value from the proteinaceous content within the cystoid spaces. And hence, this sign is considered a direct indicator of the integrity of the blood retinal barrier, because this is very often seen in diabetic macular edema. So coming on to uh, the retinal pigment epithelium, uh, we know that uh, uh, retinal outer RPE, outer retinal atrophy is RORA, and uh, I stands for incomplete, and C stands for complete RORA, or 
RP outer retinal atrophy. So CROA stands for geographic atrophy and incomplete ROA is a precursor of uh, geographic atrophy. And uh, here are the scans. Here you can see on the upper scan on the right hand side OCT, you can see the dipping of the um, outer plexiform layer. And uh, in the OCT scan on the right panel, in the lower panel, you can see it does not go, the OPL does not go all the way to the RP Brooks membrane complex. So the upper one denotes a complete ROA or a geographic atrophy. And here where the OPL does not reach all the way to the Brooks membrane is incomplete ROA. So those are the two entities we need to know. So uh, quantitatively, it should be more than 215, 50 microns in diameter to be term, termed as CRORA. So Drusen news. Here, if you follow up these patients of Drusen over a long period of time, uh, OCT is invaluable in understanding the pathophysiology of this condition. So what happens if this Drusenoid, Drusen depo this uh, deposits under the RP, extra visate into the subretinal space. And that induces phagocytosis of this lipoproteinaceous material into the RP. But this process is so overwhelming for the RP cell that it leads to cell death. And that again liberates this intracellular RP material into the subretinal space. This cascade of events leads to the collapse of Drusen and subsequent geographic atrophy. So this is called Drusen ooze. This is not a part of new vascular uh, AMD, but a process of dry AMD leading to geographic atrophy. So moving on to ectopic inner foveal layers, this uh, is relevant to the epiretinal membrane. And this is seen as a form of a continuous band straddling the foveola. It could be hypo or hyper reflective, and it straddles across the foveal region and involves the inner nuclear and inner plexiform layer. So here in this uh, uh, scan, you can see on the right, the foveal dip is maintained, but there is an epiretinal membrane and there is very minimal anatomical disruption. In the second OCT, you can see the outer uh, nuclear layer is um, ectatic and going way up to all the way to the epiretinal membrane or the foveal surface and the foveal dip is lost. In the third stage, you see that the ectopic inner layers are now seen and that is different from the stage two. The inner foveal layers are straddling the outer nuclear layer. So because of further traction and this inner layer also gets ectasia. And in the fourth stage, there is a, almost a complete anatomical disruption of the macular retinal layers. So here, uh, sometimes we can make out a difference between a combined hematoma of our retina and RP from advanced long-standing ERM by the help of an omega sign and that we'll see later. So the central bouquet anomalies are also related to epiretinal membrane. So we can deal with it here. And it, it occurs within the 100, central 100 micrometers of the fovea. And it's seen typically with stage two ERNs where the foveal uh, dip is lost and there are three stages to it. And it, all this action happens at, in the out, four uh, outer retinal layers, meaning ELM, EZ, interdigiting zone and RPE. So first there's a fuzziness of the, uh, of the ellipsoid zone, which is called cotton ball appearance. Then there is a foveolar detachment with a loculated fluid of sub, uh, subfoveal fluid. And then there is an acquired vitelliform stage. And here we see that you can see the foveal um, dip is lost. And on the right side, you can see the uh, ellipsoid zone is becoming fuzzy. In the second OCT scan on the right, you can make out the foveolar detachment. And in the third, OCT scan on the right, you can make out the acquired vitelliform region, which is hyperreflective, inferior to the uh, interdigiting zone and superior to the RPE. So there is an inherent role of Muller cells, which extend from the ILM to the ELM because of the transmitted traction, which is involved by the Muller cells in the pathophysiology of this disease entity. And here it is seen a correlation between the schema of things superiorly, how the orange colored Muller cells uh, exert traction on the outer four layers and how the disease progresses. 
So uh, the loss of parallelism is a, a common uh, a colloquial uh, phrase that we hear in the clinic, and this is denotes how parallel the line objects are to each other on OCT, and this can actually be measured. So here you can see on the right top uh, scan, uh, this box is an area of in, uh, interest, and in the B, it's magnified. In C, it is um, it's, uh, the noise reduction is done, and in the D, this is binarization, and in E denotes skeletonization. So a value can be put to this and the parallelism calculated for this area is 0.937. So it can be used for follow-up cases also. So omega sign, as we saw, this is the omega sign on the scan here. The outer retinal layers are quite preserved. We, we saw that in ERM, this can be disrupted. But here, because it's a case of uh, combined hematoma, the outer retinal layers are preserved with the, along with the uh, acute disruption of the inner layers and the omega sign. So uh, coming back to uh, macular hole surgery, uh, macular hole uh, uh, surgery can cause persistent outer retinal defects or outer foveal defects. And uh, there is also something called microcystic maculopathy. These are optically empty spaces, which are more or less square shaped, but at least one border should appear concave. Here in the on the left scan, you can see the straightening of the border of this microcystic um, lesion in the inner nuclear layer. So the ELM bulge, this is a normal uh, anatomy and uh, there is a, happens because of there's a centrifugal migration of the inner retinal layers away from the fovea with a centripetal migration of the cone photoreceptors. So preservation of foveal bulge after any kind of retinal surgery helps in denoting or prognosticating a good visual outcome. So uh, there was an um, interesting study on uh, PFTs and that is about the epiretinal neovascularization. So because uh, uh, this study was from India, I wanted to include it. And here you can see uh, even on OCTA in D2, you can clearly make out this is an epiretinal neovascularization and this is certainly added to our understanding of this disease. So PAM is a new variant of acute macular neuroretinopathy. So it is now classified into type one and type two. Here, as we can see, the type one is more superficial or in the inner retina. The type two is in the outer retina. So um, here you can see there is atrophy of the inner nuclear layer uh, in the type one. And there is atrophy of outer nuclear layer in type two. Here are two cases uh, which we managed. Here you can see with the arrow, there is a fuzziness of the outer plexiform layer and a corresponding dip in the convexity of the nerve fiber layer uh, at, uh, immediately atop it. So this was um, uh, the deep uh, capillary plexus also showing some deficits in the uh, panel B here. So uh, this was more or less a long-standing case, but we saw another acute case. Here you can see the fuzziness of the outer plexiform layer and uh, corresponding changes in the uh, OCTA here. In the this panel E, you can make out, this is right uh, at the inner uh, plexiform layer. So ORCC splitting, and there are certain, uh, certain other entities which should not be confused with subretinal fluid and be subjected to unnecessary treatment. So it's important to recognize this. This happens with best vitelliform macular dystrophy, where there is splitting at the level of RPE and Brooks membrane with collection and accumulation of this vitelliform material. So choroidal vascularity index is an established entity. I'm sure uh, uh, Jay will cover this and it involves quantification of choroidal vascularity, the, uh, measuring the ratio of lumen area to total choroidal area. And the simple way to remember is it's uh, about uh, two third uh, uh, value, uh, it comes to about 66% in uh, normals, and it can be used as a biomarker for CSR, pachychoroid spectrum, and also diabetic retinopathy. Here in a study uh, from our group, here you can see the CVI is decreasing with increasing severity of diabetic retinopathy, going down from 67% to 61%. Um, so uh, this is another uh, sign which is uh, uh, described by Dr. Gerider and his group, 
and there is a later elongation of flat irregular PED. So uh, in this article, I also saw, I could all, literally sense that it is an expanding uh, PED, but the lateral elongation is a little bit better pronounced. And they also saw in the study that it is a precursor lesion for PCV in the fellow eyes. So this could be an important sign for us to follow. And here you can see there is fluid above this irregular PED, and eventually there will be PCV lesions at the edge, this abrupt elevation of RP, this uh, polypoidal lesions at the lateral edge of the PD. So this is a good way to follow up such cases. Choroidal macro vessel uh, could be a differential for a, for a choroidal hemangioma or subretinal parasite, retinochoroidal anastomosis, or a vortex vein varix. So here you can see an example in the color fundus photo, there is a linear, curvilinear uh, uh, lesion, uh, which is running across the uh, fundus. And here you can see corresponding images of the OCT. Another case, which uh, I saw in the clinic is a large fibrovascular PD on the left, you can see, and on the right on the ICGA, you can make out a very prominent uh, uh, feeder choroidal vessel. So dome-shaped maculopathy, uh, dome-shaped macula is best detected with a vertical scan because they are most likely oriented horizontally. So you may miss if uh, you're running a horizontal line scan. In such an eye, yeah, uh, last few slides. So this could be associated with fluid or CNVM. And uh, then there are biomarkers of uh, AMD where it is important to distinguish between degenerative intraretinal cysts, which will not benefit from treatment to those which are exudative, which will benefit from treatment. So it can also help us to um, quantify the macular island in peripheral retinal uh, diseases uh, like choroideremia or Usher's disease or uh, um, other retinal degenerations. And also choroidal thicknesses are found to be reduced in Alzheimer's and this can be followed up. Um, there is a way to know the choroidal vessel, uh, vessel layer analysis, like uh, quantifying Hallers and Sattler's layer. And there are several choroidal biomarkers associated with geographic atrophy in particular, uh, namely choroidal caverns, choroidal round hyporeflective uh, 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 findings, choroidal hyperreflective foci. Here you can see there is a geographic atrophy and the RP migrates into the uh, choroid with, and is shown as hyperreflective dot echoes. So there are also hyperreflective pyramidal structures. Its importance is not very well understood, but they are known to be non-progressive and occur in the areas of geographic atrophy. So intracoroidal cavitation is associated with the myopia and uh, it is at the inferior border of the myopic conus. So there are several algorithms um, to detect uh, diaptic retinopathy, ROP and AMD with artificial intelligence and also detect their progression as Dr. Muna has covered in her talk. Uh, in her talk. Uh, reticular drusen are located above the level of the RP, while the red arrowhead show drusen which are below the RP. So likewise, packet drusen is associated with PCV and the pachychoroid spectrum. Pokhraj, uh, can I ask you to conclude your presentation? Yeah, yeah just the last few have a few slides. Yeah, just the last few slides. So outer retinal tubulations and uh, outer retinal corrugations should be uh, differentiated from subretinal fluid. There are drusen substructures, but I'll not go into that, and wedge shaped subretinal hyperreflectivity. So these three things should be differentiated from subretinal fluid to prevent overtreatment. So the, we know about SREM and laminar hole associated epiretinal pro proliferation is important to know because the uh, epiretinal membrane in this goes deep into the retina and should be careful while peeling this. So again, uh, multi-layered PED, again associated with uh, AMD. And uh, this is a uh, juxta papillary choroidal excavation with PCV. Uh, choroidal knuckle should be differentiated from a hotspot as seen in this report. And in conclusion, biomarkers are helpful in prognostication, but clinical correlation is essential. Thank you for your patient hearing and uh, apologies for overshooting the time. Thank you very much, uh, Pukraj, for that very elaborate presentation. A lot of new information probably for many of us. Uh, 
we have uh, before we move on to the next presentation by dr anand rajendran i'd like to just take very few questions uh, both for uh, anirudh as well as uh, dr muna bende before we come to your questions which are still coming in so if dr muna is still there there was a question how to differentiate between the neovascularization Uh, of the retina versus a collateral probably in the case of brbo which you had showed based on octa how would you differentiate between a neovascularization and a yeah uh, can you hear me yes yes we can hear yeah okay uh, basically neovascularization is on the surface so you would be taking a superficial slab to see the neovascularization whereas a collateral is within the uh, retina very nice point so uh, there were other questions for actually anirudh uh, quite a few questions similar from dr murlidhar and prakar goel uh, and dr indranil saab uh, would you recommend treating a subclinical cnvm in a pic patient where you don't have fluid but you are picking up some flow areas on octa so would you recommend treatment with anti vgf in such cases so i think it's still a difficult uh, choice it's challenging especially if you are seeing just a cnv on the octa but no fluid on the oct so i think the best approach uh, unless you have a guideline would be to demonstrate two things one a uh, growth of the cnv on the octa if you feel that the cnv is growing in size you go ahead and inject second if it develops into a fluid uh, i think most of us especially with the fluid study for amd coming on now would like to wait and not treat subclinical cnvs um jay you have some comment you have probably some different experience on this i i just wanted to make a comment specifically on uh, the use of octa uh, in inflammatory cnv it is extremely useful a uh, tool when we are looking at any of these uh, inflammatory diseases where we are suspecting uh, cnv but i think the important part is that you have to remember that these areas tend to have more scarring and they tend to cause more projection artifacts so there are number of times we get confused looking at the projection artifacts thinking they are the actual cnv though the octa helps to detect a very early cnv in inflammatory cnv uh, at the same time it is extremely important to understand the projection artifact and don't uh, start treating them on the basis of projection artifacts very nice That's point something. very nice point so um, there is one more question actually this one is for pukraj uh, there is a comment to that your presentation should be shown again in another webinar probably you had so much information uh, there is a question that uh, how important is a hyper reflective dot uh, this is for pukraj again and other panelists can also chip in how important is a hyper reflective dot in macular edema due to dme or vein occlusion would you change your management based on hyper reflective dots if pukraj you can go in first uh yeah so uh, generally speaking hyper reflective dotticos represent an inflammatory component because it's supposed to represent uh, macrophages uh, and macrophagic activity so um, so that is at the imaging level but uh, at the clinical trials level we know the uh, primary choice for dme and rvo Uh, will not uh, drive us to choose a steroid instead of an anti-vegf just because we see the hyperreflective dotticos on OCT. But yes, for follow-up, it certainly uh, is helpful, and uh, the number of hyperreflective dotticos you are seeing must come down, even with anti-vegf, because it has an anti-permeability uh, action. So thanks, Bhagat. Uh, uh, are there any other comments? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry about the same hyperreflective dots. I believe the concern or the questions are that because there was definitely a time where we were chasing these hyperreflective dots in the retina, considering them as an inflammatory component, and treating these patients with uh, steroid implants. However, I still don't feel that we have enough evidence to really put these patients into an inflammatory pathogenesis uh, uh, group. and start treating these patients with steroids because 
uh, there are studies which have shown equal number of uh, hyperreflective dots coming down even with the anti-VEGF. However, I still uh, treat uh, such patients uh, with steroids, though the evidence is poor. Yeah, great, great point. Uh, there's one question, probably this one, uh, maybe Anirudh can take from Dr. Mini Matthew. When there is macular subretinal fluid, is it possible to differentiate by OCT if it is due to CSR or VKH? Uh, Anirudh, can you take this? Yeah, I think uh, VKH versus CSR is it's an important uh, aspect. And I think one, I would like to do an ICG in these patients, and that would clarify if you have uh, you know, stromal granulomas in uh, VKH and if you have other features such as pachychoroid on the ICG in CSC. On the OCT angio, a VKH patient would show you those multiple hypo areas of flow deficits and we have published in Ocular Inflammation Immunology Journal. In CSC, if you have an acute CSC, you will not find any change on the OCTA. You will just have signal loss probably because of the fluid and PED, but you will not have the true uh, flow deficits on the OCTA. So I think ICG and OCTA play a very important role in establishing the diagnosis and of course clinical uh, features that you have. There could be, uh, I just wanted to make a comment, there could be some features on the OCT itself like uh, picking up posterior vitreous cells in uh, CSR, uh, VKH versus CSR and the general choroidal contour is a, is a great indicator to tell you that there, that, that there is a, a choroidal pathology which may not be seen in CSR. And, the yeah. and, and I will be I'll be showing a case uh, uh, using the choroidal imaging and differentiating VKH and CSC in my yeah. presentation. I'll be showing. Good, Jay. I think we have some questions even before your presentation for you also. So we will uh, when we come to your presentation, we'll have questions. So Anand, are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. So it is my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Anand Rajendran, Scientific Committee Convener. Uh, he, he will be talking on multicolor imaging in macular diseases. Over to you, Anand. Okay, can you uh, see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, so it's my pleasure to talk today on this uh, webinar on multicolor imaging in macular pathologies. I have no financial disclosures. So the principles uh, to begin with, uh, well, the conventional fundus cameras, you know, the entire retina is exposed to a bright flash of white light, which is essentially broad spectrum. Now, unfortunately, scattered light is also captured, and this results in a blurry image, unfortunately. The pupil diameter is a major limiting factor, whereas with the multicolor imaging, which is available on the Heidelberg systems, uh, which employs, as we know, the confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy systems, uh, this, these employ monochromatic free wavelengths, blue at 488 nanometers, green 515 and infrared at 820, now, the advantages of confocal technology can be uh, uh, crude. Uh, basically, it captures reflected light through a pinhole. Therefore, the image is less affected by reflected light or light from outside the focal plane. And therefore, the small pupil is less of an issue here. Resultant, you get a high quality, very high contrast image. Now, the high contrast is the play word here. As you can see, there's simultaneous scanning with all these three uh, wavelengths. And infrared uh, is great for showing up deep tissue pathology because it's longer wavelength, green, uh, most crucial intraretinal pathology, and blue uh, channel for superficial technology because of the smallest wavelength. So as I mentioned, blue reflectance is great for looking at inner retinal, retinal interface pathology like ILM folds, hyperretinal membranes, and these RNFL defects. Green reflectance is good for highlighting intraretinal pathology, uh, like macular edema, serous detachments, uh, vascular pathology, uh, intraretinal exudates. Infrared reflectance is good for highlighting outer retinal pathology, RP, sub RP pathology like PEDs, drusens, and the geographic atrophy. We look at a few examples. In geographic atrophy, the GA contours are very well delineated and the extent much better than, choroid, than the fundus photograph. Drusen's also the extent and the contours are better seen as seen here. Reticular pseudo drusen's, these are imaged distinctly on multicolor imaging as shown by Alton et al. far superior to color fundus photography. They often are seen with a central hyper reflective lesion with a hypo reflective lesion around it. And it often actually looks like as if uh, there's been some green stamping of the retina, uh, pinpoint stamping. Now, the Belfast Nicholas study uh, work done by Dr. Usha Chakraborty and their group, uh, they looked at uh, 
comparing the sensitivity of multicolor imaging to color fundus photography for all the different lesions of AMD. And they found that almost uniformly, uh, multicolor imaging had superior sensitivity to color fundus photography, especially for fibrosis and atrophy. With hemorrhages, it was almost the same. Now, case of uh, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, we can see very clearly that the extent and the contours of the uh, subretinal uh, hemorrhage is well seen. But I'd like to di direct your attention to uh, the hemorrhagic PD, which is darkish reddish green in color, suggesting uh, you know some kind of solid hemorrhagic content. Now, you see post PDT uh, subretinal hemorrhage goes, and you can see well defined uh, PD. But note also that the color has transitioned from that dark reddish green to a lightish green hue, suggesting perhaps that that hemorrhagic content has become a zero sanguinous one. And uh, post PDT six months, you can see that then the PD is completely resolved and there is restoration of the, uh, of the retinal hue. In diabetic macular edema, serous retinal elevations and the edematous retina on the multicolor image shows up uh, the retinal uh, hue is now green. Now with progressive and uh, sequential anti therapy, as the uh, macular detachment and the edema resolves, you can see a slow return of the reddish retinal hue and the lightening a reduction of the greenish hue as we go progressively to the point where it's almost flat and you have a return to the retinal hue. Now, this is, I think is one of the places where MCI finds real value in advanced case of for proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which is going in for a vitrectomy. As you can see here, there's thick uh, preretinal hemorrhage in red, but very interestingly, you see the fibrosed green hyaloid showing up very uh, uh, vividly and far better than the fundus photograph. Note also that there are vascular components which can be seen here and here, and areas of less vascularity or avascularity which can be seen. We can also find areas very clearly of hyaloidal openings. Now, uh, we all know that uh, for diabetic vitrectomies, it's important to take advantage or look for uh, uh, planes of cleavage planes to, uh, of the membranes vis-a-vis -vis the retinal membrane. So when you have great MCI images like this, it's great to kind of pre-plan your surgery. And that's exactly what I did. I actually went through these hyaluronic openings and actually went exactly like that with my human manual, which I can probe for segmentation. And you see post of a decent result. But what's interesting why I put this image specifically is to show you that imaging is possible through silicon oil, even on post of day one. Uh, Epiretinal membranes also, as you can see here, the extent and contour is well seen. You can see the retinal striations, and especially which is uh, those that are secondary to combined hematomas of retina, retinal pigment epithelium. You see the classic signature on the green channel, but you also see a telltale footprint on the infrared channel, which is something I often see in ERMs. The CSR uh, also, the better delineation of the subretinal fluid. Uh, pigments are also seen well. Uh, you can see that the SRF extent is well delineated on the green channel, but you can also see that the volume, uh, the impact of the volume of the SRF on the photoreceptors and the RP is seen subjectively here on the infrared image. So post uh, treatment, there's a post resolution, and you can see that the, uh, the fluid is gone on the green channel, and you can also see that uh, there is a homogeneous image uh, seen uh, once the fluid goes away on the infrared image. CRS PDs, uh, RDs uh, are associated with optic displays. Again, like CSR and macular elevation, this uh, CRS RD shows up as a green uh, hue, the better delineation. Uh, the foveal uh, area often shows a reddish hue. This is because the thin foveal tissue uh, shows up. Uh, there's a pass through of the infrared uh, uh, reflectance. Uh, OD pits, however, are not often very well seen as well as is seen on the color fundus photograph. Uh, post vitrectomy, I love getting gas. You see a good resolution and you see a restoration of the macular uh, reddish hue. You can see the craniated contours almost like a honeycomb pattern in the wide area of ILM that has been peeled. And you can see this well on the blue reflectance image also. The case of uh, posterior scleritis with uh, very dramatic and vivid appearance of the multifocal serous RDs and the macular elevation in green. And you can also actually see the areas where the PDs are also there. And the post-treatment is a dramatic resolution, and you can see the vivid contrast in the uh, pre- and the post-treatment images. Malignant hypertension also, you have uh, the uh, 
this edema showing up in green and the contiguous macular edema and elevation diaphysia also showing up in greenish contour with uh, good uh, control of BP. This results completely an easy restoration of the radiation view. Multicolor imaging and MACTEL, uh, uh, we've been part of a study group uh, headed by Jay and his team. And some of the findings of this study were that MACTEL instead uh, of involvement better than MCI and FAF, RP atrophy shows up as an orangish hue, retinal crystals well highlighted on MCI, not really discernible on autofluorescence, the foci of vessels dipping or the right angle venules are well delineated by both MCI and uh, autofluorescence. SRMEM margins and area better illuminated than autofluorescence. Uh, Interretinal pigment hyperplasia uh, of the two is seen better on MCI than RP atrophy. So this table kind of uh, puts everything together uh, and this is a publication which uh, is uh, coming up and we hope to see it uh, uh, soon in literature. Choroidal nevus uh, is well circumscribed, is intense red issue. That's because of the RP indentation by the choroidal lesion. There's uh, uh, no greenish component, obviously, because there's no overlying retinal edema or elevation. Uh, nerve fiber layer defects show well, much better on multicolor imaging than fundus photography. In spite of the fact that color fundus photography actually has better resolution, but multicolor imaging has higher contrast. And it is higher contrast which is important. Yeah, indeed, contrast is king. Ghost maculopathy is something as an artifact that uh, we see quite often with the 55 degree image. It's a hyper reflective spot. There's, uh, there's a software algorithm that has been built in for the 30 degree images. It's not really that successful with 55. That's why all my images are 30 degree images, and you get clean images with the 30 degree images. Well, all is not uh, rosy. There are disadvantages of MCI, uh, uh, multicolor imaging, the slightly longer fixation period to capture the three uh, um, wavelengths. Uh, artifacts, like I mentioned, ghost maculopathy. There are color distortions. Pseudo color learning curve is there. And uh, color fundus photography, all said and done, is true color. And there is an overlap between the hues of the pigment, hemorrhage, and scar. So in summary, multicolor imaging offers several advantages good sharpness, great contrast and clarity. The component wavelengths help unravel various pathology traits at different levels. It is a surrogate marker for pathology and prognosis. Additionally, it's part of a great combined platform of uh, all these imaging devices. It's part of this multimodal imaging device. And because of that, it's very time efficient. And with advancement of uh, non-midriatic technology, this has great potential in being a very good screening tool. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anand, for that uh, wonderful presentation, stunning images, uh, such beautiful images. Um, we are also in an era now, we should not forget uh, COVID-19, where we are trying to expose or uh, reduce our risks, actually, with investments. People, a lot of practitioners must be wondering after today's presentation, what should I buy? And if I bought already something, how do I get return on investment? So, um, Jay, I just wanted to ask you, do you have uh, multicolor imaging at UPMC and uh, how are you handling it? Oh, yes, yes, we, we do have uh, multicolor imaging and I uh, had fallen in love with this quite long back. I always like the multicolor imaging because it gives uh, three information together. What I would have achieved by uh, three different wavelengths, I'm getting it in one single image. I I think it is a very, very useful, but under uh, estimated modality. Uh, we have worked on it, and I think that we should start using it in our regular practice, and especially for the superficial uh, diseases or even the RP diseases, it is, it is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now I request you, Jay, to uh, give your uh, talk on parietal imaging and indices. Over to you, Jay. All right. Can you see my uh, presentation now? Yes. Yes. All right. So good morning. Good morning we, to. We want you to go to the slideshow. Yeah, I'm. I'm. It's just starting. Good morning to the people on this side of the world, and good evening to the most of the people on the other side of the world. So thanks, Dr. Rajendran and Dr. Narayanan for giving me the opportunity and getting. Uh, uh, the, onto this webinar. So I'll be talking about the choroidal imaging indices and how we have uh, moved to using these indices in our regular practice. Uh, 
Uh, these are my financial disclosure and I do not have any financial disclosure with this presentation. So as we all know, understand that uh, the choroid is the most posterior part of the eye. It is primarily uh, made with the vessels and the histology shows different levels of the vessels. And we all know that we have three uh, uh, levels of the vessels in choroidal capillaries, medium sized vessels and the large sized vessels. And why choroid is important because it uh, provides oxygen and nutrients to the most important structure of the retina that is uh, photoreceptor. I'll be focusing mostly uh, on the OCT because this OCT has changed our view for the choroid. And we grew up from stratus OCT to spectral domain OCT. And now we have a swept source OCT, which provides us almost a histopathological picture where we can see all the vessels uh, as we see uh, on the histology slide slides. So let's start with the choroidal thickness because this has been there with us for quite some time. And this is the picture uh, showing a myope on the top where we can see the choroidal thinning and, and patient with uh, AMD uh, at the bottom. Again, the choroid appears to be much thinner. Yeah, and yeah, these, yeah. Are, these are a typical uh, picture of the yeah, thickened yeah, yeah. Yeah, choroid yeah. Uh, yeah. where you can see uh, that the choroid is thickened in a patient with uh, CSR on the top and the thickened choroid you can see uh, in a patient with VKH at the bottom where you cannot see the posterior border of the choroid and you can see the undulation as well. We'll come to that later again. We worked to develop an algorithm for choroidal volume in 2013, and this is uh, now it is pretty much available in almost all the commercial devices where you can now get a choroidal thickness grid, as you can see on the left, as well as a choroidal uh, volume with distribution in different uh, sectors, uh, as you can see on the right. Let's look at how are we actually using in 2020 the information which we call, which we get with choroidal thickness. As we were talking about the subretinal fluid, and if you have a patient with a shallow subretinal fluid, if the choroid is thick, then it is a CSR. And if the choroid is thin, you can confidently make a diagnosis uh, of wet AMD in an old patient instead of CSR. Let's talk about the VKH and CSCR as we were uh, talking before. As you can see, the choroid is thickened in both the diseases. You see the subretinal fluid in both the diseases, but the very characteristic, you can see that the uh, a choroid in the picture on the top, which is VKH, does not show a good architecture of the choroid. You, ca you are not able to see the choroidal vessels so clearly, and I will come to that picture again when we follow up these patients with VKH. The, uh, when you have SRF is thick choroid, but you are still able to see the choroidal vessels, as you can see uh, at the bottom in a patient with CSR, the choroid is thick, but the choroidal vessels are still seen. We worked on looking at choroidal thickness. We learned that, okay, choroidal thickness is more in CSR, but can we actually use this choroidal thickness as a predictor when you are treating these patients with CSR? And when I was in LVP, we looked at this data and we found that if you really have a subfoveal choroidal thickness less than 350, then it is pretty much a chronic CSR. And when you see a patient for the first time with a subretinal fluid with not much thickened choroid, say, say uh, less than 350, that means this is pretty much a chronic CSR which needs treatment rather than observation as you can see the pictures uh, behind. Uh, let's go back to VKH and we saw this picture of VKH where the choroid is thickened and the choroidal architecture is not seen. And when this patient is treated with steroids, you can see that the, not only the choroid became thin, but now you are able to see the choroidal uh, vessels clearly, which we are not able to see before we started the treatment. And this beautiful uh, paper from Japan, which clearly shows that how the choroid is thickened in the beginning and it slowly comes down as you are treating this patient with steroids. And I believe what we are using now in our clinical practice is that we follow up these patients more carefully. And if we find an increase in choroidal thickness, then we suspect that this patient is having a recurrence before even the subretinal fluid comes in. And we should be starting these uh, patients again on steroids and put them on some immunosuppressive just by following up these patients by looking at, uh, uh, at the choroidal thickness. 
What about the choroidal vessels? As we understand that the choroid is mainly made up with choroidal vessels, then why are why are we ignoring this? And this is something which Professor Sonada from Japan, who came up with the concept of choroidal vascularity uh, visualization by binarizing these images. And I was in India at that time. We were working on automated choroidal segmentation. And I was trying to get this choroidal vascularity for the whole volume. And this is something uh, which we worked on the whole volumetric data because I wanted to get the whole volume information because choroid is a structure where you should be able to see the gross information. And the choroidal index is defined as the dark pixels divided by the total choroidal area. And this is something which we have been exploring much deeper to understand the choroidal vessels. And we went ahead and looked at multiple diseases uh, ranging from myopia, AMD, uh, CSR. But the question was that, are we actually able to use this choroidal vascularity index in our regular day-to-day -day practice? And how can we actually uh, make this as a biomarker? And this is something very interesting where I worked with my collaborators in Milan, where we actually looked at these patients with wet AMD and we found that the CVI could be a predictor for uh, AMD recurrence because we found that uh, CVI increased when the fluid was about to come back. So if you are following up your patients uh, of AMD and if you follow up closely by using CVI, you may be able to predict the AMD recurrence before you can actually see an obvious uh, fluid on the cross-sectional OCT, structural OCT, OCT. And the similar way we wanted to understand how this, the CVI could be useful when we are looking at the CSR patients. And this is the work uh, in collaboration with David Saraf in Los Angeles, where we looked at uh, the choroidal vascularity, uh, uh, effect of PDT on the choroidal vascularity, and we found that the choroidal vascularity index could be a very good uh, outcome measure and a predictor to understand whether your patient is responding to PDT or not, and if you can predict uh, any recurrence by using this indices. Uh, now we have come up with a new concept of choroidal vascularity map where we can actually now put the ETDRS map on the choroidal vascularity and we have been using this ETDRS map for many years for retinal thicknesses and now we have an algorithm where you can actually have the choroidal vascularity in each of these sectors and now we are exploiting this uh, algorithm in understanding the GA progression and the Druzen regression so we understand that which area uh, will have a faster regression or the GA progression. Uh, this is a, an example from one of our previous uh, recent publication where you can see that this map is easily showing the difference between the choroidal vascularity of normal females, one from 34, one of 34 years uh, old on the left and the 67 year old on the right, where you can see the choroidal thickness map on the top and the bottom shows the choroidal vascularity index and these values, which I'm sure you're not able to see, but these values are actually the average mean uh, of these individual sectors and which is what we will be using in coming future. What about the wide field choroidal vascularity? Because now we can use the 55 degrees uh, spectralis uh, lens where you can actually go almost up to the equator as you can see on this image. And we were interested in understanding that can we actually see the choroidal vascularity index and how does it actually change as we move to the periphery up to the equator, we could assess and we saw that the choroidal vascularity in fact, uh, cho the choroidal vascular content in fact increases as we move to the periphery. And uh, uh, one more very interesting concept is that actually you go ahead and measure the individual choroidal vessels. And this is one of my papers from LVP, where we actually looked at the individual vessel layer in a, in a myopic patients who were non-pathologic with 20-20 vision. And we found that there is a significant medium-sized uh, vessel thickness compared to their age-matched emetropes. Um, and this was something very useful, which we will be uh, looking at in future. This is a very typical example of CSR, where you can see that uh, the large choroidal vessel thickness in the outer part of the choroid is, is much thickened compared to the inner choroid. And this again explains the whole concept of pachychoroid, which I'm not going into the detail. 
What about uh, taking this heller vessel thickness to the wide field? And this is the work which we did with my collaborators in Italy, where we looked at the, uh, the large choroidal vessel thickness up to the mid equator. And this is a very uh, beautiful graph where we published recently in scientific reports where you can assess the uh, large choroidal vessel thickness uh, graphs very uh, nicely. And you can see compared with the choroidal thickness maps as uh, choroidal thickness up to the periphery as well. What about taking this work to the um, uh, automated segmentation? This is some of our work which we published uh, in 2018. And now we have the Heller vessel volume doing uh, for the whole volumetric uh, data obtained from the macular thickness, ma macular uh, area. And this could be uh, very useful in understanding pachychoroid. I think on first uh, scanning, and there was a nice question about the structural on first. This, uh, this technology is very underutilized, and this is this provides us a very important information about the whole architecture, uh, retina, as well as the choroid going all the depths, and you can actually play around with these uh, scans and understand the changes. And we took the choroidal uh, scans and we binarized these, and now we have an on-fast uh, vascularity where we removed the shadows, as you can see in the middle panel, where we have done the shadow compensation and removed the retinal vessels, and now we have an on-fast choroidal vascularity, and we use this uh, algorithms in patients with CSC, and we learned that how the uh, on fast vascularity changes from top of the choroid to the uh, bottom of the choroid. And we are now using this uh, uh, technology in understanding the choroidal scleral border in these patients. Uh, not to leave aside the choroidal hyperreflective dots. I know this is a new concept which is coming up uh, recently, but I was interested in looking at these choroidal hyperreflective dots and what does it uh, show and we we can see these choroidal hyperreflective dots in many diseases, inflammatory like toxo at the bottom image, the PCV, the AMD. But uh, what does it actually signify? Still, it is very uh, uh, minimally understood, uh, but we are ex exploring this in various diseases. And this is the paper on choroidal hyperreflective dots in star guards. And we were interested in actually going ahead and making the quantification of these uh, hyperreflective dots. And we came up with an algorithm where you can actually measure these uh, hyperreflective dots. And I wanted to use it for following up uh, the CSR and AMD patients. And this is one of our paper which got accepted recently, which clearly shows that how the choroidal uh, hyperreflective dots changes in patients with acute and chronic CSC. And we are exploring uh, this in various diseases. This is an example of retinitis pigmentosa. And we aim to develop a 3D uh, model of the choroid where we envision that we will be able to track down uh, uh, the vessels which are making the PCV polyps or the, um, the CNV complex. I hope we can achieve this soon. I did not get into the details of OCD NGO using uh, in choroid. Uh, because the previous speakers have already spoken quite a bit, but I think the main utility is choroidal capillary voids, uh, early CNV uh, identification, CNV quantification, uh, and non-exudative and nascent uh, CNV detection. So I will just conclude by saying that we have uh, a lot of choroidal biomarkers which are coming up and we are trying to get the quantification of these biomarkers so we can use it in our clinical practice. And I'm sure that we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and then I would like to acknowledge LV Prasad where I work, did most of my work. And thank you very much for listening and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jay. That was an excellent presentation again. Uh, we have a gush of questions and um, great images, uh, great concepts, uh, very nicely explained. So uh, I'll uh, kind of start off with uh, the questions, so a bunch of questions. Um, some of them are uh, allied to each other. So uh, one particular question is about, uh, can choroidal vascular index uh, predict morphing to CSCR and uh, PCV, also allied with CV, uh, choroidal vascular indexes? Can it uh, uh, predict, uh, rec I mean, uh, can it predict a recurrence of uh, post anti vegf So are the fluctuations like you showed with PDT, uh, there is a change like that. Would you would it be useful in looking at or predicting recurrences post anti vegf 
therapy yeah so so this was one of my slides showed that we published in iuvs where we could actually predict the um, recurrence in wet amd by using the cvi so i believe that definitely it has much more scope uh, in future so i think that uh, once we have these standardized algorithms for almost all the devices then we will be able to use this index and i believe that it definitely has a role in uh, predicting and looking at the outcome okay there's a question for me uh, from dr murlidhar uh, do you think uh, which disease would you think that mci is a game changer so uh, i wouldn't say it's an absolute game changer in many things it's just that you know we all like to do fundus photograph very often it's limited by all the all that i said media opacity and small pupil what i really love using mci is for as i meant showed you that particular case where you have advanced pdr and you have clear media and you want to plan your surgery and you can see these areas of vascularity and avascularity and plan your biomanuals or your unimanual vitrectomies that way it's great for looking at uh, edematous or macular uh, elevations uh, so i think th this is where you really get an edge uh, with mci of course people are looking at the finer things like we talked about uh, mactel but uh, essentially uh, this is where i i would like looking at uh, using mci any comments uh, yeah, yeah i i just wanted to say that uh, i think mci has a very good role uh, in the understanding the extent of the disease what you just said uh, say it is a superficial disease or the csr or even the ga but what i have used particularly it is for actually looking at the ischemia uh, in some patients with brvo you will be surprised that you will be able to actually see the enlargement of the foveal avascular zone or sometimes the the ischemia which is very close to the fovea in brvo which clearly explains that why your patient does not have 2020 yeah also you can it's not just looking at the composite image it will break up the chromatic wave lengths uh, sometimes even like i showed you cases uh, it can show you your post tra your trauma post surgery i ilm peels and why uh, there is an unexplained visual loss so even looking at that the separate wavelengths can it can make a difference uni would you like to add something and uni is also somebody who likes using Uh, yeah so no i just uh, just as a small thing that uh, we found it to be useful in asteroid hyalosis because the wavelength penetrates and you can see the retina where you can't take a color photograph properly that was one thing the second uh, is uh, like i said um, like you said uh, we've used it to look at post operative ilm peels to see uh, if the uh, macular hole doesn't close whether the dimensions of the ilm uh, you've actually peeled sometimes you get a clue as to you probably might have not have peeled enough so you get clues of that um however like uh, like jay was saying i love to use it in geographic atrophy and all those conditions like auto fluorescence also it gives you one more particular color element to see whether the uh, even the extent of the atrophy the depth of the atrophy whether it is uh, you can probably differentiate between cirroras and iroras uh, the oct equivalence of those using uh, multicolor yeah so there been studies which show that you know it is as good as auto fluorescence for uh, geographic atrophy and to specifically look at uh, you know foveal sparing geographic atrophy the best actually in that analysis was uh, oct as the oct so uh, that is there is a question for uh, uh, jay uh, in a resolved vkh patient how to time the edi scans for follow up to identify an early recurrence uh i i believe that uh, i am not a uvit specialist but i believe that i don't call myself a uvit specialist it's such a difficult branch so i i believe that uh, if once you have got the uh, resolution and once you are confident that your immunosuppressors are working then i think following up your patients two monthly or three monthly in the beginning this is what i do i usually follow them up two monthly and once i feel confident that they are okay like after first 6 months if they are good then we can push them to 3 monthly and then uh, once you have finished a year follow up then maybe 6 monthly should be good enough as long as the immunosuppressors are, are working well i think anirudh may have something better to add in anirudh would you like i agree with you i think uh, what you're saying i agree with you i have a question for jay yeah go ahead vinod uh, hi jay uh, it was excellent talk so you've been working a lot on uh, choroidal thickness in uh, all the pachycoroid disorders 
we all know that uh, the choroid is definitely thickened but what are your thoughts on why it is thickened in these pachycoroidal disorders okay so you, you are trying to nail it now <laughs> nobody knows unfortunately we don't know and i know that uh, we had this discussion uh, that where the problem is but because in uh, last year or so i was just thinking that probably the sclera is at fault which is actually not letting uh, the because the sclera is actually a pachy sclera rather which is causing this but we tried quite a lot and we really could not get a very good scleral imaging uh, by using either b scan or even uh, good oct so i think scleral th imaging will will help us to understand it more and now what we are believing is that probably the vortex drainage is at fault somewhere so there could be a uh, vortex uh, uh vein widening where they are exiting the eye that could be at fault so i believe this is a combination of theories which i'm sure that uh, uh you also know but uh, we really don't have any answer and as always uh, we are just treating the effect of the, the actual pathogenesis but we are not able to hit the pathogenesis so far thank you so much so one uh, question for anand yeah sure is there a way that uh, the multicolor imaging can provide clues to uh, pick up early signs of conversion from a choroidal nevus to a melanoma well i don't know that i'm not totally an on oncologist myself but uh, yeah perhaps if there is uh, uh, you know some amount of fluid coming up which you can perhaps see but then i think there Uh, the ocd itself would uh, show up and uh, i mean what we we saw from dr uh, maishan mugam's excellent talk the other day fluid yeah this one we should with the anand can you hear us uh, we have lost your connection uh one maybe quick comment about uh, again the mci is that the nice with uh, um, emulsified silicon oil just in a in a similar uh, way or analogy to the steroids it gives us uh, a good picture of the retina in uh, cases with unexplained visual loss uh, where the emulsified droplets uh, cover the foveal area and uh, just to make sure that uh, there's nothing as such wrong with the macula but uh, maybe the media opacity it's, itself is causing a decreased uh, vision yeah thanks thank you thank you jay also for the wonderful presentation i think we'll move on to the final talk for today by dr vinod agarwal on ultra wide imaging in retinal practice over to you vinod yeah good evening everyone uh, i hope you are able to see my screen and hear me clearly yes we can okay lovely uh to begin with i would like to say that i have no financial interest in the product mentioned and just to begin with just a little story uh documentation is what is very important nowadays and especially with the medical legal era we have already entered it is becoming more and more important to document whatever we are doing so traditional fundus cameras covers up cover up to 30 to 40 degrees of posterior pole and imaging beyond traditional was first introduced by etdrs when they introduced seven standard fields and it covers up to around 75 degrees of retina however a large part of the retina still could not be imaged and most of the peripheral lesions we could not document uh, all we could do is image it with the uh, draw it with color diagrams which are have a huge subjective variability so now we have different wide field systems and the uh, optos imaging system is what i am going to talk about uh one recent update on the subject is that recently there has been a classic consensus uh definition that anything which beyond uh, images beyond the equ equator in all four quadrants will be considered as ultra wide field while anything which does not cover the uh, cover it beyond the equator will be called wide field now optos is basically a confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy which using a virtual point technology and lipsoid mirror gives us fast uh, uh, 
in a very fast manner non contact images of the retina which are high resolution and can provide us the same images through a very small pupil also we know that it uses two monochromatic lasers of 633 and 523 nanometers now we have optos california which can give us additional icg images and optos have come up with the latest model that is silverstone which covers which gives us a wide field swept source oct scan of around 23 mm now just a very few cases to begin with uh, before i go to the individual diseases this is a young male 20 year old who came to us with the slight deterioration of vision vision was 6 by 9 and we could see that there is a epiretinal membrane and of course we tried to capture the posterior pole and surrounding retina with the help of seven sensor fields but we could not find any abnormality and then we sent the patient uh, to our lab for the further imaging optos imaging we can see that there in the periphery there are some abnormalities so subsequently mm, we went on to do ffa of this patient and we can see on the steered images in the temporal periphery that there are multiple aneurysmal telangiectasia of the peripheral vessels indicating that this was a patient of coats disease which has developed telangiectasia and that has secondarily led to epiretinal membrane on the macula so that way we could find the cause of the epiretinal membrane in this particular patient so this is another patient again a 20 year old male who had a full thickness macular hole at the posterior pole and the patient vehemently denied the history of trauma neither were there any signs of trauma at the posterior pole or in the anterior segment so we went on to image this patient and we could see in the periphery there are some vague pigmentary changes which on fundus autofluorescence did show that there are some hyper and hypo autofluorescence with some hyper autofluorescence at the macula the other eye was uh, normal absolutely normal so we came to conclusion that this patient must have had a trauma which patient could not recall again a uh, young female who presented to us with a macular hole with bilateral disc edema now just looking at the posterior pole uh, the diagnosis is very difficult to make out but a single wide field image we see a cystic sulcus in the inferior cavity this patient had a neurocystic sarcosis along with a cystic sulcus in the vitreous cavity which probably came into the vitreous cavity through a macular hole so this is just to summarize few of our cases where ultra wide field really make a difference in the diagnosis and subsequent management of these patients now coming to individual disorders i like to show these images again and again this is a middle aged male who presented to us with neovascular glaucoma you can see the optic atrophy is there the patient has undergone panretinal photocoagulation decent amount and if you see carefully on the top there is anterior retinal cryotherapy scars which patient had, had undergone but in spite of all this the patient uh, progressed and went on to become pl negative if you do the ultra wide field imaging and ffa you can see there are large areas of capillary drop out which have not been addressed in this particular patient and that is probably why this patient kept on progressing so this is the other eye of the patient 618 vision poorly dilating pupil this is what we could capture on a conventional ffa uh, there are large areas of capillary drop out at the posterior pole but uh, if you do a ultra wide field we can see that it's fairly well lasered but a ultra wide field fluorescence angiogram shows that there is persisting nvd and large areas of capillary dropout which still not needs to be addressed so this patient is at the risk of uh, developing to the same fate of the other eye if we do not treat such patients adequately so again coming to this patient with proliferative diabetic retinopathy you can see a angry looking nvd and a neovascularization elsewhere along with pre retinal hemorrhages but the moment we turn on to the ultra wide field we see that whole of the periphery has been knocked out and this patient is very high risk for progressing to neovascular glaucoma of late we have been getting reports that we get two kinds of diabetic retinopathy one is predominantly posterior diabetic retinopathy where the anterior retina is predominantly normal on the other hand we get another kind of diabetic retinopathy where 50% of the actual lesions lie anterior to the uh, seven etdr7 standard fields so this indicates more risk of progression though at this stage we don't know who are the patients who develop predominantly posterior disease and which are the patients who develop disease anterior to the equator 
so in diabetic retinopathy ultra wide field is very useful for exact localization of the non perfusion quantification of the non perfusion and it may act as a guide to targeted laser therapy though it has not found it its foothold in the management of diabetic retinopathy early detection of peripheral nv nv is another useful thing we can do with the help of ultra wide field image coming to venous occlusions and this is a patient with the brvo you can see multiple nvs i found a disc and uh, put a blue circle around it and then i tried to fit the black area that is capillary drop out with all these blue circles and see there are around 60 circles which we could fit so traditionally in a brvo we've been taught that five disc diameters of non perfusion is significant but with wide field we know that this is much underestimated and actual non perfusion required for be uh, patients with vascular occlusion is much higher to go on to develop neovascularization in crvo now we know that greater than 75 disc diameters of uh, non perfusion is high risk of neovascularization while 30 disc diameters is low risk however there are no set guidelines in the setting for brvo so again have a look at this image on a cursory look it very much looks like a diabetic retinopathy proliferative diabetic retinopathy we have a neovascularization of the disc and neovascularization elsewhere but if you see all the lesions none of them are at the posterior pole and they are in the periphery so we know that this is a this is we are dealing with the case of ocular ischemic syndrome and not proliferative diabetic retinopathy and hence it becomes a very important teaching and a teaching tool again have a look at this particular patient looks like patient has a crao with the attenuated arteries and cherry red spot the ffa shows that there is macular infarction and we there is a nvd we do believe that on these findings that patient has crao and oct confirms our diagnosis but look what we found on ultra wide field imaging there are triangular areas of hyper fluorescence which are now which are referred to as a malaric sign and it indicates patient does not only have retinal artery non perfusion the patient is also suffering from choroidal hypoperfusion and these are choroidal infarcts coming to vasculitis this is something we have worked on this is a patient who has undergone decent amount of laser but see whole of the periphery has been knocked out and there is persisting nvd this patient underwent ultra wide field guided complete laser and nvd promptly regress so in our study we found that ultra wide field imaging is uh, excellent for the documentation of the peripheral lesions in these eyes it is again very good for some of the peripheral vascular disorders like fevr where the pathology lies in the temporal and the nasal periphery and you can see there is exudation there is peripheral avascularity and the neo neovascularization which can be very well assessed on the ultra wide field angiography so coming to some of the other capillary hemangiomas retinal tumors which are not so uncommon in our tertiary care referral center while these uh, lesions are very easy to put on naked eye examination these small lesions are something which can be picked on ultra wide field angiography and we know that it it is easier to treat them when they are small once they grow out uh, of their bounds it's very very difficult to treat these lesions so it becomes very useful to pick these peripheral small lesions and treat them early and we have found certain novel findings in these patients and reported earlier coming to a patient of uveitis this uh, is something anirudha showed earlier again a patient of uh, young female who who was in her second trimester had multiple spots at the posterior pole well, of course we could not do a angiography did a wide field autofluorescence so we can see these hyper autofluorescent spots which are emanating from the disc and going to the mid periphery we know that this is a patient of mutes and does not need to be treated and will recover on her own with the passage of time other kind of uveitis for example cmb right retinitis in this particular patient while this is little atypical because the disease is posterior and is a case of leukemia but once the disease progresses ultra wide field is an excellent uh, tool for uh, monitoring of progression of these cases we all have read about toxocara granulomas but have never documented one so this picture gives us a excellent idea of how the disease pathology is and acts as an excellent teaching tool for the postgraduate 
uh, residents. Again, you can uh, document the peripheral findings in the setting of high myopia in cases with retinal detachment where the montaging techniques are very difficult. So again, this is a patient with giant retinal tear and uh, this patient was aphakic and had no lens. We could not use oil in this patient, underwent uh, vitrectomy with gas tamponade and we could see that patient had attached retina and hence this act as a good patient education tool. And one advantage of ultra wide field imaging is that we can look through the gas bubble as well. Coming to dystrophies, uh, it has uh, shed new light on uh, the pathophysiology of dystrophies like PPRCA. Earlier we have reported that these are actually the <coughs> form frustic cases of retinitis pigmentosa since the autofluorescence pattern resemble RP and over a period of time, these eyes can develop on to, go on to develop retinitis pigmentosa. Some of the dystrophies like Stargard disease, which have been uh, thought to be a macular disorder with the advent of ultra wide field imaging, we know that these dystrophies go on to involve the periphery of the retina and ultra wide field is very useful for the detection of these peripheral abnormalities. And uh, again, we have published regarding that uh, something where it will be very difficult to make a montage, but with a single click, we can capture the, peri the whole of the periphery. You can see the pigmented abnormalities in the para uh, arcade area. And if you see on OCT, there are uh, skytic areas. We know that we are dealing with the case of Goldman Fabry. So in congenital disorders, it's very useful since the patients tend to have poor vision, nystagmus, and non-dilating pupil. So conventional imaging modalities may be difficult. Ultra wide field is an excellent tool for the monitoring of the peripheral disease in these cases. Right? But everything which has uh, arises come with thorns. So it has certain limitations. It has only red and green lasers. So no two true colors. So it may be a problem when the color of the lesion is important to distinguish the subtle uh, pathologies. Again, we are trying to greedy, striving to be better. 360 aura to aura view is not uh, available or visible in these uh, with these equipment. But nowadays with the machine has inbuilt software, we can make automated montages of the steered images. Superior and inferior retina are not so well imaged. And of course, there are inherent uh, problems of uh, projecting a curved surface onto the flat surface. So that leads to peripheral distortion and the measurements are not correct. And of course, most important is the cost and it is not so widely available in all the practices. Just a single case about wide field ICG, elderly male hypertensive who was found to have a peripheral uh, RP rip in the right eye. And the left eye showed some irregular staining on FFA. So when we did the ICG in this eye, we could see that there are well-defined polyps in this eye. And now we know that peripheral polyps are a common occurrence in these eyes of PEHCR. So to conclude, ultra wide field is an efficient, fast, non-contact uh, method of obtaining high quality images. It is excellent tool for a documentation and monitoring of the peripheral pathology and has definitely provided new insights into the peripheral retinal disorders. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vinod, again for um, excellent documentation and uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, before we conclude in a few minutes, um, we would have some questions. Um, I think one question for you, Vinod, is uh, what do you think is the prospect of ultra wide field OCT in the near future? Uh, I think, sir, we are already using it with the help of. Uh, tools like top cons web source even with spectralis we have wide field uh, uh, oct images we can uh, again take steered images and we can go right up to the equator and there are few articles which have been coming up lately to uh, which shed light new light on the pathophysiology of peripheral retinal disorders so it's very much possible sir and i think with the in next uh, coming years, we'll be doing the OCT of right up to the aura. There is a question from Dr. Jatinder Singh uh, about what are the changes in the peripheral retina in AMD if we have done uh, retinal uh, wide field imaging in patients with AMD. Does it correlate with uh, posterior pole changes in terms of progression? Uh, 
sir we have not actually done a study ourselves but uh, it is very common to find peripheral changes in the amd eyes especially on autofluorescence and ffa images but there is available literature which suggests that peripheral changes are present in these amd eyes in large number of patients but they can be independent of the posterior pole disease and in some eyes we do hardly get to see posterior pole disease but the peripheral of the eyes is found to be affected very nice observation there is a question I for just... uh, dr pukraj yeah dr pukraj uh, yes. from dr vishal agarwal uh, have you come across epithelial membrane proliferation in macular holes as suggested in some reports in literature if yes how is the surgical management and prognosis different from routine <laughs> macular <laughs> surgery so um, in some of the macular holes and uh, even symptomatic lamellar macular holes there is an epiretinal proliferation which tends to have uh, xanthophyll pigment onto it one must be careful in dealing with such cases because this xanthophyll pigmented epiretinal membranes tend to be attached to the middle or the deep retina so if you go ahead and pull it intra posteriorly tug it you might end up uh, you know may, uh, doing more harm than good so it is uh, a good idea to have a tangential removal of this if it's very tenacious then it's best to trim it to the uh, max possible rather than to peel it in its entirety uh, i think we're losing dr bukran so uh, so basically i'll just repeat in a line or two Yeah. the membranes which are xanthophyll pigmented we had need to be more careful because their attachment is in the deeper retina okay all right okay uh, question for uh, j uh, the question about swept source oct a and uh, the new sd oct coming up uh, which is 6000 uh, zeiss oct so is that uh, good enough are the edi scans on that uh, good enough and can they be used uh, in your uh, the swept source oct especially in this octave uh, in this covid period where people can't afford higher end imaging uh, honestly speaking if we are actually talking about uh, the oct ngo in our regular day to day practice while treating the patients so we are still not able to exploit i would say because i'm sure there is some information which is hiding there which is useful but we are still not able to exploit the choroidal information using the oct ngo because of the poor resolution or uh, the technology we are still not able to use the oct ngo part of the choroid architecture however i would say that in a day to day practice if you are trying to get information only up to the rpe or say choreo capillaries both the devices are uh, pretty good okay uh, yeah i think uh, anand uh, can we conclude with uh, dr biridhar's remarks now uh, sure uh, so this has been a great session i'd like to thank all the speakers for putting in excellent efforts uh, and bringing out these great presentations i'd like to thank all of you attending this i hope you have enjoyed it as much as we have i'd like to invite dr giridhar sir our former president to give the closing comments for this session uh thank you anand and uh, nice to hear a uh, very as he said very informative and uh, excellent session and uh, very uh, what should i say very knowledgeable young team and uh, nice to see jai chablani also after a long time and uh, i thought i'll just say a few i can do i have 3 minutes Uh, yes please please do yeah, yeah. Please so please I, i mean i thought the first four talks were on octa and i think they were all wonderful talks i mean but uh, you know i uh, i i am a novice as far as octa is concerned although i have been using octa for the last couple of years now but the question i ask myself always is in what way has octa improved patient care in retinal practice i mean that's the question i always ask myself and uh, to that's the i mean that's the question actually i asked one of the speakers also and if i have to sum up i think uh, i would like to say two or three points one is to uh, detect subclinical choroidal neovascular membrane and that was beautifully shown by dr anirudha in a inflammatory case 
and I think in an inflammatory case, the chances of it progressing is very high. And therefore, it cannot be treated as, a, as an age-related choroidal neovascular membrane at all. So I think the question whether this, that could have been treated even when it was detected is, a, I mean, I think is a, very big, is a very big question that we need to answer. And I think if you do that, probably you become a, your, your, you'll develop a protocol. We always wait for the best to do it. So we should not wait for Jai to do something for us to do it, right? So that's number two. So it's useful in detecting type 1 choroidal neovascular membrane where ICG and FFA may be inconclusive. And it is useful in situations where probably fluorescein angiography cannot be done. Because today we have very good SD OCT biomarkers to diagnose all these diseases. So there are specific advantages of doing OCTA. The, and unfortunately, OCTA fails in follow-up. I thought that OCTA will be very useful for us and give us some useful biomarkers to tell us which are the sort of cases where you can find early recurrence once you have treated. But unfortunately, to my knowledge, as of today, we do not have any useful OCTA biomarkers during follow-up to tell us, yes, probably do, you do see occasionally increase in the size of the membrane. When you see the follow-up where there is no active disease, probably that tells you that these patients need more regular follow-up. But nonetheless, still we do not have enough data and that's what I'm looking for. And that will be very useful in clinical practice. Sir, can I make that, a comment on this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I believe that actually Octa plays a more important role in following up the patients. Okay. A, why, we, why, why we get disappointed is that because the, when you started treating the patients, the architecture of the retina changed. Because the architecture of the retina changed, your automated segmentation changed, and what yeah. image you saw last time, it is not the same this not time. Same. But rather, if you actually correct that or understand that this is changed because of the correction of the architecture, it is very useful. And especially if you actually uh, are trying to follow up your CNV patients, then I would say that don't try to look at only at the size of the complex, but actually start seeing the pruning of the vessels where you will be yeah. able to see that those thick vessels or these dead tree appearance yeah, has started yeah. flowering yeah. again. Is the so I think it is just... the dead tree. Yeah. May I yes, add sir. a comment to this? Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, we've already uh, started looking and predicting, looking at the pattern itself which is the leaking neovascular membrane because you do see that it's a little thicker it looks a little fuzzier it's not as white as the other one that's what i have noticed and very often that is the one that shrinks that part and that is the one that comes back as well so i think it's good especially when you're seeing patients every month when you're looking at patients on long-term treatment and you're trying to find that uh, happy medium where you can call them back. I definitely think in AMD it has a role. No. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So, up in uh, your talk on diabetic retinopathy was very useful. And I think we are trying to understand the vascular changes. What I felt is that the question that I asked you is, uh, what is the I mean, role of uh, Okta in routine medical retina practice as far as DR is concerned? I thought that in patients with a moderate to severe NPDR with good visual acuity, probably, you know, an octa will be very useful. One is it may be able to detect a subtle neovascularization because in some of these patients, we are hesitant to do a fluorescein angiography. Number two is that the increase in the size of the four-wheel avascular zone, probably because a lot of reports that are coming that, that uh, they, where they show that the ischemia in the posterior pole is an indication of the progression of the disease. So probably these are two areas where, as a routine, we can at least do OCTA, at least to prognosticate patients and also to advise on more careful follow-up. Do you agree with me on that? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So the talk on multicolor was very interesting. We also do a lot of multicolor. What I want to say is all these three wavelength pictures are taken simultaneously. They are not overlapping. They are all taken simultaneously, and that's where the, you know it, it it gives you so much of uh, you know information and also the depth because they are all taken simultaneously. I feel it's very useful in ERMs, epiretinal membrane morphology is seen beautifully in uh, especially to educate patients preoperatively. It's very good because you see the beautifully the extent of the ERM, which is not really seen in a normal color photography. So to that extent, that's another very useful uh, application of the. ERM, I mean the multicolor photography. 
So other than that, I think all the talks were very good, very informative. The only suggestion I have to the moderators is that I think next time you please make it a little less time. One and a half hours of the program and nice half an hour of discussion. Probably two and a half, three hours is quite a long time sitting in front of a computer. Anyway, thank you all. I hope all of you, you are uh, having a nice, I mean, praying to God. And uh, across the world, I hope uh, that the second half of 2020 will be better than the first half of 2020. Thank you very thank much. You, sir. Thank you very much. Stay thank, safe. You. thank you, sir. We thank can sponsor you. a coffee or a drink next time during the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, Anand, thank you very much for the wonderful yeah, uh, program you. that you have put together. It has been a feast. So many messages are coming from all across the world, actually. Yeah. Uh, I thank congratulate you. you. And also, the next uh, seminar will be an important one about COVID-19 okay. and retina practice, which Anand is putting together along with Manisha Agrawal and Prashant Bhavankali. They will be the moderators. Dr. Anand Rajendra will be sending out the details of that. I, Thank you I, all so much. I mean, I as far as this COVID-19 and retina practice is concerned, my, I mean, one suggestion to you all, please give very clear information. Because, you know, already, you know, I was just sitting here. Now the elective surgeries are slowly going to start in our state. The Kerala government has given the green signal that from next week, private hospitals and government hospitals can start elective surgery in a small way. So already so many questions are coming and each person, you know, giving different opinions. The one thing that is everyone wants to know is whether COVID testing has to be done routinely in all patients coming for elective surgery. Now, this is the one question that is coming up uh, time and again as to whether COVID testing for COVID is mandatory in patients entering the operation theater for elective surgery. We, we will try to answer all the questions. Yeah. Yeah. We will we'll try to answer. Yeah, okay. we, we have an eminent panel. We will have very good speakers uh, and we'll, we'll try to get it across. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so awesome. much. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.